Section zero of War Poems and Other Verses by R. E. Fairned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. War Poems and Other Verses by Robert Ernest Fairned. Introduction Too much can never be said in praise of the generous beauty of the gesture with which the youngest generation of Englishmen, just emerging on the golden threshold of life, have greeted the sacrifice of their hopes and ours. It has filled our history with new and magnificent figures which will excite the enthusiasm and awaken the gratitude of our race for centuries to come. But while we admire this miraculous courage of the very youthful paladins of the war, something should still be reserved for the praise of those who have been brought face to face with the illusions of peacetime and who had if we may say so got into the habit of not being soldiers but who yet at the call of duty sprang to the height of their disinterested patriotism the poet whose verses we collect to-day was one of those who might well believe that their age absolved them from an active part in the profession of arms he was indeed above the limit then set upon military service when the declaration of war disturbed him among his books and his flowers nothing in his past life had prepared him for such an activity he was as he said himself a dreamer yet when the call to national duty came he suddenly awoke as a sleeper under the trumpet to the utmost activity of enterprise this is a case of the class of heroism which is most easily ignored and which it is yet stupid and ungrateful of us to undervalue here we are invited to contemplate an aspect of the higher energy even in the martial order which is not included among the roses and myrtles of sweet two and twenty vernet's attitude towards war is worthy of particular notice because the nature of his occupations and tastes had led him to his fortieth year without any predilection for military matters and without any leaning to what are called jingo views but when once the problem of the attack of germany on the democracy of the world was patent to him he did not hesitate for a moment he accepted completely and finally the situation nor did he ever doubt the righteousness of the cause of the allies nor hesitate in his conviction that it must be conducted to victory with full resolution a few weeks before his death he wrote in terms of scrupulous courtesy to a pacifist who had asked leave to include england to the sea in an anthology designed to exclude verses which might contribute to a continuation of ill-feeling between the various nations to this visionary vernet replied not for generations to come will there be any need to fan the embers against a people whose rulers have found logic and brutality and have urged their own necessities as an excuse for oppression i do not think there is much hatred out here in france among our fighting men but there will be memories among those who have seen what culture has inflicted on their comrades i believe that if we had been fighting against men less filled with this logic of devilry the mere horrors of modern war would have brought about a peace whatever historians or statesmen may make of it we are fighting against the spirit that exults in such horrors Robert Ernest Verned was born in London on the 4th of June, 1875. He was of French extraction, representing the younger branch of a southern family, the Verned de Cornelians, who were driven from their estates in 1685 by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. The family dropped the de Cornelian and settled in Java, whence the poet's grandfather, Henri Verned, proceeded in the early part of last century, marrying an Englishwoman and becoming a British citizen. Robert Louis Stevenson mentions the ancestral castle of the Verneds in his travels with the donkey. The family coat of arms, for those interested in these things, is an orange tree on a golden field with a raven clutching at an orange that falls from the tree. Essentially English in sentiment, the English branch of the Verneds has never ceased to pride itself on its pure french ancestry after passing through st paul's school r e verned went to oxford where he took a classical exhibition at st john's college 
he left oxford in eighteen ninety eight and four years later he married miss carol howard fry who survives him and he settled down to a quiet country life at standon in hertfordshire he occupied his abundant leisure in reading and writing with a continual increase of ambition to succeed he published several novels the pursuit of mr favio in nineteen o five muriel of the moors in nineteen o six he visited bengal in the company of his wife and produced on his return an ignorant in india which has received high commendation success came slowly to him but he was beginning to be recognized as a writer of solid promise when the outbreak of war transfigured his whole vision of life it has been seen that the temperament and habits of vernet had not in any way prepared him for fighting and that yet when the crisis came he faced it at once though his years were mature he was one of the earliest to dedicate himself without reserve to the service of the state and to prepare to be a soldier he had playfully complained that life was humdrum it suddenly became perilous and splendid one who knew him well describes the way in which vernet faced the new conditions with the airman's faraway vision he took his fine headlong plunge to inspire us on our creek to death in more prosaic language at the beginning of september nineteen fourteen he enlisted as a private in a public school's battalion the nineteenth royal fusiliers although he was so much above the highest limit for enlistment and he received a commission in the rifle brigade early in nineteen fifteen before going to france he had six months commission service in the fifth battalion of the same regiment in the isle of Sheppey. in france he was attached to the third battalion of the rifle brigade one of the four regular battalions of that regiment vernet's earliest experience of actual warfare was made in the trenches on the evening of friday january seventh nineteen sixteen from that time until his death fourteen months later he was constantly in the thick of the fighting save for a short time at the end of nineteen sixteen when he was at home wounded he was with the infantry the whole time resisting all suggestion of transference to more comfortable billets he started in the ill-famed salient one of his first turns of duty in the trenches was taken during a prolonged and very violent bombardment of our lines on coming out the battalion received the thanks of the general officer commanding the division at the end of march the battalion was moved slightly south to the neighborhood of plogstert wood in the early autumn it went further south again to take part in the battle of the somme during this fighting the captain commanding vernet's company went sick for a short time and vernet was put in temporary command he was so acting when a shrapnel wound in the thigh on september first nineteen sixteen sent him home to england after a quick recovery at oxford and in his own hertfordshire home and a short time of light duty in sheppy having absolutely refused to let a friend in the war office try to find him even temporary work there for fear it might impede his return he went back to the front in the last days of nineteen sixteen the battalion he joined though of the rifle brigade was not the one he had left i'm told that rarely happens this was a service battalion and in actual length of experience apart from its quality vernet had probably the advantage of most of his brother officers but the commands had all been lately filled up so he became merely the newest joined subaltern he was disappointed being full of ideas which thus had no outlet but accepted the arrangement as natural and unavoidable and his captain has testified to the unselfish loyalty and modesty which made it possible for others to do the same he was back again in very much the same region in which he had been before his wound later he saw and was deeply moved by the ravages committed by the germans in their retreat on easter day he wrote as usual to his wife and spoke of the summer at last coming on and that perhaps the war would end this year and he would see his home again early the next morning the ninth of april nineteen seventeen he was leading his platoon in an attack on havencourt wood when he was mortally wounded and died the same day the circumstances of his death repeat the story of a thousand such events in this prodigious war vernet was in charge of his platoon on the advance 
and was in front with a couple of his men when they suddenly came upon a concealed enemy machine gun he was hit and it was immediately seen that the wound was serious his men carried him back alive to the aid station but he died upon the further journey he was buried in the french cemetery at la chelle his friend captain f e spurling put up a cross and planted around it a large bowl of daffodil bulbs which had been the joy of the poet when they flowered in the company mess they now in their long sleep watch over his rest he greatly endeared himself to those by whose side he worked and fought from a sheaf of private tributes from his fellow soldiers i am permitted to quote one or two passages captain g tatham says we served together in the same company from november fifteenth nineteen sixteen to last may and we were a very happy party as happy at least as it is possible to be in such circumstances that we were so was in no small measure due to Fairned. he was a delightful companion and an excellent man to have in a battalion always cool and collected in the trenches and always ready to lighten the dull monotony of billets with his quiet sense of humour i now remember sadly that we used to accuse him of making notes for a future book in which all the weaknesses of his brother officers were to stand revealed the late captain andrew buxton speaks of Vernet's extraordinary bravery over and over again undertaking and carrying through the most unhealthy bits of work with all his thought for the men he was with and none for himself he loved the ncos and whenever any misfortune happened to one of his men it was manifest that Vernet felt it intensely our time together was the most splendid imaginable and i shall always look back on it with recollections that can never be forgotten Vernet's closest friend mr f g salter to whom i am indebted for so much of the preceding information gives me the following impression of him in physical appearance Vernet was of rather more than average height dark with olive complexion his face was very regular and oval he was strikingly good-looking and his movements the most graceful of any creatures i have seen he was a good skater swimmer and lawn tennis player and could walk enormous distances when he chose he never seemed to change at all from what he was like at oxford his manner was quiet and reserved or what might have seemed reserved to people first meeting him underneath this lay a keen observation of human nature in all kinds and classes and a humour which on occasion could be sarcastic anything pretentious or pompous was a sure target a lesser condemnation was reserved for conduct which was not perfectly natural and easy except among intimates he would often sit silent while others talked and then unexpectedly say something from an unwanted angle which lit up the whole question he was entirely without affectation and certainly not disposed to put the artist on a pedestal above ordinary men every form of life interested him he had the solidest stand on his mother earth his temper was quite impossible to ruffle i don't think in all these years i have ever once known him put out or moody it is not surprising that he became popular with the young officers among whom he was thrown and with his men especially when the latter were in any sort of trouble to his friends he gave a generous and never-failing sympathy they have lost the best man they have known his hatred of war was intense and positive he hated the cruelty it inflicts and denied it as a test of efficiency but his feeling went beyond that he loved ardently the things which war destroys the good human life of fellowship and adventure the kindliness between man and man the thousand labors under the sun to him it was a clear-cut issue of right and wrong when germany let loose this evil upon europe neither did he feel any hesitation as to his own duty the greatness of england had always been the background of his thought now he dreamer as he calls himself could serve her he was a poor man an enlistment meant for him the immediate cutting off of a greater part of his and his wife's livelihood it meant too of course subordination as a private to all sorts of stupid duties and persons but he at once enlisted and only took a commission when it had become clear that that was the greater need he was not at all indifferent to death he loved life with a solid english love he loved his garden his art his friends above all he loved the wife who for many years since their betrothal 
had been the inspirer and encourager of everything he did and who was so in this decision also and to the end he was greatly desired to come back alive after the war but it seemed to him that such a desire was for the present simply irrelevant found among his papers after his death were the opening lines of an unfinished poem he had noted it as one intended to be included in a collection he was contemplating but if he ever finished the completion remains in his head alone the lines are as follows i seek new sons i will not die earth hath not shown me half her store from an eloquent tribute written by another former schoolfellow and friend mr g k chesterton on receiving the news of vernet's death i quote a confirmatory passage he always remained even in face and figure almost startlingly young there went with this the paradox of a considerable maturity of mind even in boyhood a maturity so tranquil and as it were so solitary as to be the very opposite of prickishness he had a curious intellectual independence i remember him maintaining in our little debating club that shakespeare was overrated not in the least impudently or with any foreshadowing of a shavian pose but rather like a conscientious student with a piece of greek of which he could not make sense he was too good a man of letters not to have learnt better afterwards but the thing had a touch of intangible isolation that surprised the gregarious mind of childhood he had in everything even in his very appearance something that can only be called distinction something that might be called in the finer sense race this was perhaps the only thing about him except his name and his critical temper that suggested something french i remember his passing a polished and almost meridithian epigram to me in class it was i regret to say an unfriendly reflection on the french master and even on the french nation and his person but i remember thinking even at this time that it was rather a french thing to do there was a certain noble contradiction in his life and death that there was also in his very bearing and bodily habit no man could look more lazy and no man was more active even physically active he would move as swiftly as a leopard from something like sleep to something too unexpected to be called gymnastics it was so that he passed from the english country life he lived so much with its gardening and dreaming to an ambush in a german gun in the lines called before the assault perhaps the finest of his poems he showed how clear a vision he carried with him of the meaning of all this agony and the mystery of his own death no printed controversy or political eloquence could put more logically let alone more poetically the higher pacifism which is now resolute to dry up at the fountainhead the bitter waters of the dynastic wars than the four lines that run then to our children there shall be no handling of fate so vain of passion so abhorred but peace the peace which passeth understanding not in our time but in their time o lord the last phrase which has the force of an epigram has also the dignity of an epitaph and its truth will remain to this admirable judgment i can add nothing except to say that the great quality of vernet's war poems seems to me to reside in that directness of which mr chesterton speaks he is filled by a consciousness of the fine plain issues of the struggle between darkness and light hence his verses emphasize our love of england our veneration for her past our confidence in her future our steady and determined purpose moreover he insists our keeping sharp the blade of indignation whose edge is for ever being rubbed down by sentimentality vernet indulges in no absurd diatribes or hate songs but his poems and letters show that personal acquaintance with the dreadful accidents of his new profession had convinced him of the necessities of the moment they had convinced him beyond all disproof that the peculiar teutonic effort exercised for instance as at arras or in belgium was to put it plainly infamous to punish and for the future to prevent such wickedness as this was the object and the entire sufficient object of the self-sacrifice which has brought the farmer from canada and the shepherd from new zealand and incidentally had drawn vernet himself from his hertfordshire garden no doubt it is the evidence of this directness in his verses which has given them their first popularity
Edmund Goss, July 1917. End of section zero. End of introductory note by Edmund Goss, C.B. Section zero of War Poems and Other Verses by R. E. Fairned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. War Poems and Other Verses by Robert Ernest Verned. Introduction Too much can never be said in praise of the generous beauty of the gesture with which the youngest generation of Englishmen, just emerging on the golden threshold of life, have greeted the sacrifice of their hopes and ours. It has filled our history with new and magnificent figures which will excite the enthusiasm and awaken the gratitude of our race for centuries to come but while we admire this miraculous courage of the very youthful paladins of the war something should still be reserved for the praise of those who have been brought face to face with the illusions of peacetime and who had if we may say so got into the habit of not being soldiers but who yet at the call of duty sprang to the height of their disinterested patriotism the poet whose verses we collect to-day was one of those who might well believe that their age absolved them from an active part in the profession of arms he was indeed above the limit then set upon military service when the declaration of war disturbed him among his books and his flowers nothing in his past life had prepared him for such an activity he was as he said himself a dreamer yet when the call to national duty came he suddenly awoke as a sleeper under the trumpet to the utmost activity of enterprise this is a case of the class of heroism which is most easily ignored and which it is yet stupid and ungrateful of us to undervalue here we are invited to contemplate an aspect of the higher energy even in the martial order which is not included among the roses and myrtles of sweet two and twenty Vernet's attitude towards war is worthy of particular notice, because the nature of his occupations and tastes had led him to his fortieth year without any predilection for military matters, and without any leaning to what are called jingo views. But when once the problem of the attack of Germany on the democracy of the world was patent to him, he did not hesitate for a moment. He accepted, completely and finally, the situation nor did he ever doubt the righteousness of the cause of the allies nor hesitate in his conviction that it must be conducted to victory with full resolution a few weeks before his death he wrote in terms of scrupulous courtesy to a pacifist who had asked leave to include england to the sea in an anthology designed to exclude verses which might contribute to a continuation of ill-feeling between the various nations to this visionary Vernet replied not for generations to come will there be any need to fan the embers against a people whose rulers have found logic and brutality and have urged their own necessities as an excuse for oppression i do not think there is much hatred out here in france among our fighting men but there will be memories among those who have seen what culture has inflicted on their comrades i believe that if we had been fighting against men less filled with this logic of devilry the mere horrors of modern war would have brought about a peace whatever historians or statesmen may make of it we are fighting against the spirit that exults in such horrors robert ernest verned was born in london on the fourth of june eighteen seventy five he was of french extraction representing the younger branch of a southern family the verned de cornelians who were driven from their estates in sixteen eighty five by the revocation of the edict of nantes the family dropped the de cornelian and settled in java whence the poet's grandfather henri verned proceeded in the early part of last century marrying an englishwoman and becoming a british citizen robert louis stevenson mentions the ancestral castle of the verneds in his travels with the donkey the family coat of arms for those interested in these things is an orange tree on a golden field with a raven clutching at an orange that falls from the tree essentially english in sentiment 
the english branch of the vernets has never ceased to pride itself on its pure french ancestry after passing through st paul's school r e verned went to oxford where he took a classical exhibition at st john's college he left oxford in eighteen ninety eight and four years later he married miss carol howard fry who survives him and he settled down to a quiet country life at standon in hertfordshire he occupied his abundant leisure in reading and writing with a continual increase of ambition to succeed he published several novels the pursuit of mr faviel in nineteen o five muriel of the moors in nineteen o six he visited bengal in the company of his wife and produced on his return an ignorant in india which has received high commendation success came slowly to him but he was beginning to be recognized as a writer of solid promise when the outbreak of war transfigured his whole vision of life it has been seen that the temperament and habits of vernet had not in any way prepared him for fighting and that yet when the crisis came he faced it at once though his years were mature he was one of the earliest to dedicate himself without reserve to the service of the state and to prepare to be a soldier he had playfully complained that life was humdrum it suddenly became perilous and splendid one who knew him well describes the way in which verned faced the new conditions with the airman's faraway vision he took his fine headlong plunge to inspire us on our creek to death in more prosaic language at the beginning of september nineteen fourteen he enlisted as a private in a public school's battalion the nineteenth royal fusiliers although he was so much above the highest limit for enlistment and he received a commission in the rifle brigade early in nineteen fifteen before going to france he had six months commission service in the fifth battalion of the same regiment in the isle of Sheppey. in france he was attached to the third battalion of the rifle brigade one of the four regular battalions of that regiment Vernet's earliest experience of actual warfare was made in the trenches on the evening of friday january seventh nineteen sixteen from that time until his death fourteen months later he was constantly in the thick of the fighting save for a short time at the end of nineteen sixteen when he was at home wounded he was with the infantry the whole time resisting all suggestion of transference to more comfortable billets he started in the ill-famed salient one of his first turns of duty in the trenches was taken during a prolonged and very violent bombardment of our lines on coming out the battalion received the thanks of the general officer commanding the division at the end of march the battalion was moved slightly south to the neighborhood of plogstert wood in the early autumn it went further south again to take part in the battle of the somme during this fighting the captain commanding vernet's company went sick for a short time and verned was put in temporary command he was so acting when a shrapnel wound in the thigh on september first nineteen sixteen sent him home to england after a quick recovery at oxford and in his own hertfordshire home and a short time of light duty in sheppey having absolutely refused to let a friend in the war office try to find him even temporary work there for fear it might impede his return he went back to the front in the last days of nineteen sixteen the battalion he joined though of the rifle brigade was not the one he had left i'm told that rarely happens this was a service battalion and in actual length of experience apart from its quality vernet had probably the advantage of most of his brother officers but the commands had all been lately filled up so he became merely the newest joined subaltern he was disappointed being full of ideas which thus had no outlet but accepted the arrangement as natural and unavoidable and his captain has testified to the unselfish loyalty and modesty which made it possible for others to do the same he was back again in very much the same region in which he had been before his wound later he saw and was deeply moved by the ravages committed by the germans in their retreat on easter day he wrote as usual to his wife and spoke of the summer at last coming on and that perhaps the war would end this year and he would see his home again early the next morning the ninth of april nineteen seventeen he was leading his platoon in an attack on havencourt wood 
when he was mortally wounded and died the same day the circumstances of his death repeat the story of a thousand such events in this prodigious war werned was in charge of his platoon on the advance and was in front with a couple of his men when they suddenly came upon a concealed enemy machine gun he was hit and it was immediately seen that the wound was serious his men carried him back alive to the aid station but he died upon the further journey he was buried in the french cemetery at la chelle his friend captain f e sperling put up a cross and planted around it a large bowl of daffodil bulbs which had been the joy of the poet when they flowered in the company mess they now in their long sleep watch over his rest he greatly endeared himself to those by whose side he worked and fought from a sheaf of private tributes from his fellow soldiers i am permitted to quote one or two passages captain g tatham says we served together in the same company from november fifteenth nineteen sixteen to last may and we were a very happy party as happy at least as it is possible to be in such circumstances that we were so was in no small measure due to Verned. he was a delightful companion and an excellent man to have in a battalion always cool and collected in the trenches and always ready to lighten the dull monotony of billets with his quiet sense of humour i now remember sadly that we used to accuse him of making notes for a future book in which all the weaknesses of his brother officers were to stand revealed the late captain andrew buxton speaks of verned's extraordinary bravery over and over again undertaking and carrying through the most unhealthy bits of work with all his thought for the men he was with and none for himself he loved the n c o s and whenever any misfortune happened to one of his men it was manifest that verned felt it intensely our time together was the most splendid imaginable and i shall always look back on it with recollections that can never be forgotten verned's closest friend mr f g salter to whom i am indebted for so much of the preceding information gives me the following impression of him in physical appearance verned was of rather more than average height dark with olive complexion his face was very regular and oval he was strikingly good-looking and his movements the most graceful of any creatures i have seen he was a good skater swimmer and lawn tennis player and could walk enormous distances when he chose he never seemed to change at all from what he was like at oxford his manner was quiet and reserved or what might have seemed reserved to people first meeting him underneath this lay a keen observation of human nature in all kinds and classes and a humour which on occasion could be sarcastic anything pretentious or pompous was a sure target a lesser condemnation was reserved for conduct which was not perfectly natural and easy except among intimates he would often sit silent while others talked and then unexpectedly say something from an unwanted angle which lit up the whole question he was entirely without affectation and certainly not disposed to put the artist on a pedestal above ordinary men every form of life interested him he had the solidest stand on his mother earth his temper was quite impossible to ruffle i don't think in all these years i have ever once known him put out or moody it is not surprising that he became popular with the young officers among whom he was thrown and with his men especially when the latter were in any sort of trouble to his friends he gave a generous and never-failing sympathy they have lost the best man they have known his hatred of war was intense and positive he hated the cruelty it inflicts and denied it as a test of efficiency but his feeling went beyond that he loved ardently the things which war destroys the good human life of fellowship and adventure the kindliness between man and man the thousand labours under the sun to him it was a clear-cut issue of right and wrong when germany let loose this evil upon europe neither did he feel any hesitation as to his own duty the greatness of england had always been the background of his thought now he dreamer as he calls himself could serve her he was a poor man an enlistment meant for him the immediate cutting off of a greater part of his and his wife's livelihood it meant too of course subordination as a private to all sorts of stupid duties and persons but he at once enlisted 
and only took a commission when it had become clear that that was the greater need he was not at all indifferent to death he loved life with a solid english love he loved his garden his art his friends above all he loved the wife who for many years since their betrothal had been the inspirer and encourager of everything he did and who was so in this decision also and to the end he was greatly desired to come back alive after the war but it seemed to him that such a desire was for the present simply irrelevant found among his papers after his death were the opening lines of an unfinished poem he had noted it as one intended to be included in a collection he was contemplating but if he ever finished the completion remains in his head alone the lines are as follows i seek new sons i will not die earth hath not shown me half her store from an eloquent tribute written by another former schoolfellow and friend mr g k chesterton on receiving the news of vernet's death i quote a confirmatory passage he always remained even in face and figure almost startlingly young there went with this the paradox of a considerable maturity of mind even in boyhood a maturity so tranquil and as it were so solitary as to be the very opposite of prickishness he had a curious intellectual independence i remember him maintaining in our little debating club that shakespeare was overrated not in the least impudently or with any foreshadowing of a shavian pose but rather like a conscientious student with a piece of greek of which he could not make sense he was too good a man of letters not to have learnt better afterwards but the thing had a touch of intangible isolation that surprised the gregarious mind of childhood he had in everything even in his very appearance something that can only be called distinction something that might be called in the finer sense race this was perhaps the only thing about him except his name and his critical temper that suggested something french i remember his passing a polished and almost meredithian epigram to me in class it was i regret to say an unfriendly reflection on the french master and even on the french nation in his person but i remember thinking even at this time that it was rather a french thing to do there was a certain noble contradiction in his life and death that there was also in his very bearing and bodily habit no man could look more lazy and no man was more active even physically active he would move as swiftly as a leopard from something like sleep to something too unexpected to be called gymnastics it was so that he passed from the english country life he lived so much with its gardening and dreaming to an ambush in a german gun in the lines called before the assault perhaps the finest of his poems he showed how clear a vision he carried with him of the meaning of all this agony and the mystery of his own death no printed controversy or political eloquence could put more logically let alone more poetically the higher pacifism which is now resolute to dry up at the fountainhead the bitter waters of the dynastic wars than the four lines that run then to our children there shall be no handling of fate so vain of passion so abhorred but peace the peace which passeth understanding not in our time but in their time o lord the last phrase which has the force of an epigram has also the dignity of an epitaph and its truth will remain to this admirable judgment i can add nothing except to say that the great quality of vernet's war poems seems to me to reside in that directness of which mr chesterton speaks he is filled by a consciousness of the fine plain issues of the struggle between darkness and light hence his verses emphasize our love of england our veneration for her past our confidence in her future our steady and determined purpose moreover he insists our keeping sharp the blade of indignation whose edge is for ever being rubbed down by sentimentality vernet indulges in no absurd diatribes or hate songs but his poems and letters show that personal acquaintance with the dreadful accidents of his new profession had convinced him of the necessities of the moment they had convinced him beyond all disproof that the peculiar teutonic effort exercised for instance as at arras or in belgium was to put it plainly infamous to punish and for the future to prevent such wickedness as this was the object and the entire sufficient object 
of the self-sacrifice which has brought the farmer from canada and the shepherd from new zealand and incidentally had drawn vernad himself from his hertfordshire garden no doubt it is the evidence of this directness in his verses which has given them their first popularity edmund goss july nineteen seventeen end of section zero end of introductory note by edmund goss c b Section Zero of War Poems and Other Verses by R. E. Fairned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. War Poems and Other Verses by Robert Ernest Fairned. Introduction Too much can never be said in praise of the generous beauty of the gesture with which the youngest generation of Englishmen, just emerging on the golden threshold of life, have greeted the sacrifice of their hopes and ours. It has filled our history with new and magnificent figures which will excite the enthusiasm and awaken the gratitude of our race for centuries to come. But while we admire this miraculous courage of the very youthful paladins of the war, something should still be reserved for the praise of those who have been brought face to face with the illusions of peacetime and who had if we may say so got into the habit of not being soldiers but who yet at the call of duty sprang to the height of their disinterested patriotism the poet whose verses we collect to-day was one of those who might well believe that their age absolved them from an active part in the profession of arms he was indeed above the limit then set upon military service when the declaration of war disturbed him among his books and his flowers nothing in his past life had prepared him for such an activity he was as he said himself a dreamer yet when the call to national duty came he suddenly awoke as a sleeper under the trumpet to the utmost activity of enterprise this is a case of the class of heroism which is most easily ignored and which it is yet stupid and ungrateful of us to undervalue here we are invited to contemplate an aspect of the higher energy even in the martial order which is not included among the roses and myrtles of sweet two and twenty vernet's attitude towards war is worthy of particular notice because the nature of his occupations and tastes had led him to his fortieth year without any predilection for military matters and without any leaning to what are called jingo views but when once the problem of the attack of germany on the democracy of the world was patent to him he did not hesitate for a moment he accepted completely and finally the situation nor did he ever doubt the righteousness of the cause of the allies nor hesitate in his conviction that it must be conducted to victory with full resolution a few weeks before his death he wrote in terms of scrupulous courtesy to a pacifist who had asked leave to include england to the sea in an anthology designed to exclude verses which might contribute to a continuation of ill-feeling between the various nations to this visionary vernad replied not for generations to come will there be any need to fan the embers against a people whose rulers have found logic and brutality and have urged their own necessities as an excuse for oppression i do not think there is much hatred out here in france among our fighting men but there will be memories among those who have seen what culture has inflicted on their comrades i believe that if we had been fighting against men less filled with this logic of devilry the mere horrors of modern war would have brought about a peace whatever historians or statesmen may make of it we are fighting against the spirit that exults in such horrors Robert Ernest Verned was born in London on the 4th of June, 1875. He was of French extraction, representing the younger branch of a southern family, the Verned de Cornelians, who were driven from their estates in 1685 by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. The family dropped the de Cornelian and settled in Java, whence the poet's grandfather, Henri Verned, proceeded in the early part of last century, marrying an Englishwoman and becoming a British citizen. 
robert louis stevenson mentions the ancestral castle of the verneds in his travels with the darkey the family coat of arms for those interested in these things is an orange tree on a golden field with a raven clutching at an orange that falls from the tree essentially english in sentiment the english branch of the verneds has never ceased to pride itself on its pure french ancestry after passing through st paul's school r e verned went to oxford where he took a classical exhibition at st john's college he left oxford in eighteen ninety eight and four years later he married miss carol howard fry who survives him and he settled down to a quiet country life at standon in hertfordshire he occupied his abundant leisure in reading and writing with a continual increase of ambition to succeed he published several novels the pursuit of mr favio in nineteen o five muriel of the moors in nineteen o six he visited bengal in the company of his wife and produced on his return an ignorant in india which has received high commendation success came slowly to him but he was beginning to be recognized as a writer of solid promise when the outbreak of war transfigured his whole vision of life it has been seen that the temperament and habits of verned had not in any way prepared him for fighting and that yet when the crisis came he faced it at once though his years were mature he was one of the earliest to dedicate himself without reserve to the service of the state and to prepare to be a soldier he had playfully complained that life was humdrum it suddenly became perilous and splendid one who knew him well describes the way in which verned faced the new conditions with the airman's faraway vision he took his fine headlong plunge to inspire us on our creek to death in more prosaic language at the beginning of september nineteen fourteen he enlisted as a private in a public school's battalion the nineteenth royal fusiliers although he was so much above the highest limit for enlistment and he received a commission in the rifle brigade early in nineteen fifteen before going to france he had six months commission service in the fifth battalion of the same regiment in the isle of sheppey in france he was attached to the third battalion of the rifle brigade one of the four regular battalions of that regiment verned's earliest experience of actual warfare was made in the trenches on the evening of friday january seventh nineteen sixteen from that time until his death fourteen months later he was constantly in the thick of the fighting save for a short time at the end of nineteen sixteen when he was at home wounded he was with the infantry the whole time resisting all suggestion of transference to more comfortable billets he started in the ill-famed salient one of his first turns of duty in the trenches was taken during a prolonged and very violent bombardment of our lines on coming out the battalion received the thanks of the general officer commanding the division at the end of march the battalion was moved slightly south to the neighborhood of plogstert wood in the early autumn it went further south again to take part in the battle of the somme during this fighting the captain commanding verned's company went sick for a short time and verned was put in temporary command he was so acting when a shrapnel wound in the thigh on september first nineteen sixteen sent him home to england after a quick recovery at oxford and in his own hertfordshire home and a short time of light duty in sheppey having absolutely refused to let a friend in the war office try to find him even temporary work there for fear it might impede his return he went back to the front in the last days of nineteen sixteen the battalion he joined though of the rifle brigade was not the one he had left i'm told that rarely happens this was a service battalion and in actual length of experience apart from its quality verned had probably the advantage of most of his brother officers but the commands had all been lately filled up so he became merely the newest joined subaltern he was disappointed being full of ideas which thus had no outlet but accepted the arrangement as natural and unavoidable and his captain has testified to the unselfish loyalty and modesty which made it possible for others to do the same he was back again in very much the same region in which he had been before his wound later he saw and was deeply moved by the ravages committed by the germans in their retreat 
on easter day he wrote as usual to his wife and spoke of the summer at last coming on and that perhaps the war would end this year and he would see his home again early the next morning the ninth of april nineteen seventeen he was leading his platoon in an attack on havencourt wood when he was mortally wounded and died the same day the circumstances of his death repeat the story of a thousand such events in this prodigious war Werned was in charge of his platoon on the advance and was in front with a couple of his men when they suddenly came upon a concealed enemy machine gun he was hit and it was immediately seen that the wound was serious his men carried him back alive to the aid station but he died upon the further journey he was buried in the french cemetery at la chelle his friend captain f e spurling put up a cross and planted around it a large bowl of daffodil bulbs which had been the joy of the poet when they flowered in the company mess they now in their long sleep watch over his rest he greatly endeared himself to those by whose side he worked and fought from a sheaf of private tributes from his fellow soldiers i am permitted to quote one or two passages captain g tatham says we served together in the same company from november fifteenth nineteen sixteen to last may and we were a very happy party as happy at least as it is possible to be in such circumstances that we were so was in no small measure due to Fairned. he was a delightful companion and an excellent man to have in a battalion always cool and collected in the trenches and always ready to lighten the dull monotony of billets with his quiet sense of humor i now remember sadly that we used to accuse him of making notes for a future book in which all the weaknesses of his brother officers were to stand revealed the late captain andrew buxton speaks of Vernet's extraordinary bravery over and over again undertaking and carrying through the most unhealthy bits of work with all his thought for the men he was with and none for himself he loved the ncos and whenever any misfortune happened to one of his men it was manifest that Vernet felt it intensely our time together was the most splendid imaginable and i shall always look back on it with recollections that can never be forgotten Vernet's closest friend mr f g salter to whom i am indebted for so much of the preceding information gives me the following impression of him in physical appearance Vernet was of rather more than average height dark with olive complexion his face was very regular and oval he was strikingly good-looking and his movements the most graceful of any creatures i have seen he was a good skater swimmer and lawn tennis player and could walk enormous distances when he chose he never seemed to change at all from what he was like at oxford his manner was quiet and reserved or what might have seemed reserved to people first meeting him underneath this lay a keen observation of human nature in all kinds and classes and a humour which on occasion could be sarcastic anything pretentious or pompous was a sure target a lesser condemnation was reserved for conduct which was not perfectly natural and easy except among intimates he would often sit silent while others talked and then unexpectedly say something from an unwanted angle which lit up the whole question he was entirely without affectation and certainly not disposed to put the artist on a pedestal above ordinary men every form of life interested him he had the solidest stand on his mother earth his temper was quite impossible to ruffle i don't think in all these years i have ever once known him put out or moody it is not surprising that he became popular with the young officers among whom he was thrown and with his men especially when the latter were in any sort of trouble to his friends he gave a generous and never-failing sympathy they have lost the best man they have known his hatred of war was intense and positive he hated the cruelty it inflicts and denied it as a test of efficiency but his feeling went beyond that he loved ardently the things which war destroys the good human life of fellowship and adventure the kindliness between man and man the thousand labors under the sun to him it was a clear-cut issue of right and wrong when germany let loose this evil upon europe neither did he feel any hesitation as to his own duty the greatness of england had always been the background of his thought now he dreamer as he calls himself could serve her 
he was a poor man an enlistment meant for him the immediate cutting off of a greater part of his and his wife's livelihood it meant too of course subordination as a private to all sorts of stupid duties and persons but he at once enlisted and only took a commission when it had become clear that that was the greater need he was not at all indifferent to death he loved life with a solid english love he loved his garden his art his friends above all he loved the wife who for many years since their betrothal had been the inspirer and encourager of everything he did and who was so in this decision also and to the end he was greatly desired to come back alive after the war but it seemed to him that such a desire was for the present simply irrelevant found among his papers after his death were the opening lines of an unfinished poem he had noted it as one intended to be included in a collection he was contemplating but if he ever finished the completion remains in his head alone the lines are as follows i seek new sons i will not die earth hath not shown me half her store from an eloquent tribute written by another former schoolfellow and friend mr g k chesterton on receiving the news of vernet's death i quote a confirmatory passage he always remained even in face and figure almost startlingly young there went with this the paradox of a considerable maturity of mind even in boyhood a maturity so tranquil and as it were so solitary as to be the very opposite of prickishness he had a curious intellectual independence i remember him maintaining in our little debating club that shakespeare was overrated not in the least impudently or with any foreshadowing of a shavian pose but rather like a conscientious student with a piece of greek of which he could not make sense he was too good a man of letters not to have learnt better afterwards but the thing had a touch of intangible isolation that surprised the gregarious mind of childhood he had in everything even in his very appearance something that can only be called distinction something that might be called in the finer sense race this was perhaps the only thing about him except his name and his critical temper that suggested something french i remember his passing a polished and almost meridithian epigram to me in class it was i regret to say an unfriendly reflection on the french master and even on the french nation and his person but i remember thinking even at this time that it was rather a french thing to do there was a certain noble contradiction in his life and death that there was also in his very bearing and bodily habit no man could look more lazy and no man was more active even physically active he would move as swiftly as a leopard from something like sleep to something too unexpected to be called gymnastics it was so that he passed from the english country life he lived so much with its gardening and dreaming to an ambush in a german gun in the lines called before the assault perhaps the finest of his poems he showed how clear a vision he carried with him of the meaning of all this agony and the mystery of his own death no printed controversy or political eloquence could put more logically let alone more poetically the higher pacifism which is now resolute to dry up at the fountainhead the bitter waters of the dynastic wars and the four lines that run then to our children there shall be no handling of fate so vain of passion so abhorred but peace the peace which passeth understanding not in our time but in their time o lord the last phrase which has the force of an epigram has also the dignity of an epitaph and its truth will remain to this admirable judgment i can add nothing except to say that the great quality of vernet's war poems seems to me to reside in that directness of which mr chesterton speaks he is filled by a consciousness of the fine plain issues of the struggle between darkness and light hence his verses emphasize our love of england our veneration for her past our confidence in her future our steady and determined purpose moreover he insists our keeping sharp the blade of indignation whose edge is for ever being rubbed down by sentimentality vernet indulges in no absurd diatribes or hate songs but his poems and letters show that personal acquaintance with the dreadful accidents of his new profession had convinced him of the necessities of the moment they had convinced him beyond all disproof 
that the peculiar Teutonic effort, exercised, for instance, as at Arras or in Belgium, was, to put it plainly, infamous. To punish and for the future to prevent such wickedness as this was the object, and the entire sufficient object, of the self-sacrifice which has brought the farmer from Canada and the shepherd from New Zealand, and incidentally had drawn Vernet himself from his Hertfordshire garden. No doubt it is the evidence of this directness in his verses which has given them their first popularity. Edmund Goss, July 1917 End of Section 0 End of Introductory Note by Edmund Goss, C.B. Section 1 of War Poems and Other Verses by R. E. Vernhead. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War Poems, Part 1. To C. H. V. What shall I bring to you, wife of mine, when I come back from the war? A ribbon your dear brown hair to twine? A shawl from a Berlin store? Say, shall I choose you some prussian hack when the uhlans we overwhelm shall i bring you a potsdam goblet back and the crest from a prince's helm little you'd care what i laid at your feet ribbon or crest or shawl what if i bring you nothing sweet nor maybe come home at all ah but you'll know brave heart you'll know two things i'll have kept to send mine honour for which you bade me go and my love my love to the end. England to the sea. Hearken, O mother, hearken to thy daughter. Fain would I tell thee what men tell to me, saying that henceforth no more on any water shall I be first or great, or loved or free, but that these others, so the tale is spoken, who have not known thee all these centuries, by fire and sword, shall yet turn England broken back from thy breast and beaten from thy seas me whom thou bearest where thy wave should guard me me whom thou suckledest on thy milk of foam me whom thy kisses shaped what while they marred me to whom thy storms are sweet and ring of home behold they cried she has grown soft and strengthless all her proud memories changed to fear and fret say thou who hast watched through ages that are lengthless? Whom have I feared, and when did I forget? What sons of mine have shunned thy worlds and races? Have I not reared for thee time and again, and bid go forth to share thy fierce embraces? Sea ducks, sea wolves, sea rovers, sea men? Names that thou knowest, great hearts that thou holdest, rocking them, rocking them in an endless wake captains the world can match not with its boldest hawk howard grenville frobisher drake nelson the greatest of them all the master who swept across thee like a shooting star and while the earth stood veiled before disaster caught death and slew him there at trafalgar mother they knew me then as thou didst know me then i cried peace and every flag was furled but I am old, it seems, and they would show me that never more my peace shall bind the world. Wherefore, O sea, I, standing thus before thee, stretch forth my hands unto thy surge, and say, When they come forth who seek this empire o'er thee, and I go forth to meet them, on that day God grant to us the old armata weather, the winds that rip, the heavens that stoop and lower. Not till the sea and England sink together shall they be masters let them boast that hour august nineteen fourteen the call lad with the merry smile and the eyes quick as a hawk's and clear as the day you who have counted the game the prize here is the game of games to play never a goal the captains say matches the one that's needed now put the old blazer and cap away England's colors await your brow. Man with the square-set jaws and chin, always it seems you have moved to your end, sure of yourself, intent to win. Fame and wealth and the power to bend, all that you made your call to spend, all that you sought 
you're asked to miss what ambition compared with this that a man lay down his life for his friend dreamer oft in your glancing mind brave with drinking the fairy brew you have smitten the ogres blind when the fair princess cried out to you dreamer what if your dreams are true yonder is a bayonet magical since him who it strikes the blade sinks through take it and strike for england prince friend with a face so hard and worn the devil in you have sometimes met and now you curse the day you were born and want one boon of god to forget ah oh, but i know and yet and yet i think out there in the shrapnel spray you shall stand up and not regret the life that gave you so splendid a day lover of ease you've lolled and forgot all the things that you meant to write life has been soft for you has it not what offer does england make to-night this to toil and to march and to fight as never you've dreamed since your life began this to carry the steel-swept height this to know you played the man brothers brothers the time is short nor soon again shall it so be tied that a man may pass from the common sort sudden and stand by the hero's side are there some that being named yet bide hark once more to the clarion call sounded by him who deathless died this day england expects you all august nineteen fourteen the indian army into the west they are marching this is their longed-for day when that which england gave them they may at last repay when for the faith she dealt them peasants and priests and lords when for the love they bear her they shall unsheath their swords men of the plains and hillmen men born to warrior roles tall men of matchless ardor small men with mighty souls rulers alike and subjects splendid the roll-call rings rajas and maharajas kings and the sons of kings bikanir patiala Rathlam and Kishangar, Jodhpur, who rides the leopard down, Sashin and Kuch Bihar, from lands where skies are molten and suns strike down and parch, out of the east they're marching, into the west they march. O oh, little nimble Gurkhas, who won a hundred fights, O oh, Sikhs, the Sikhs who fail not upon the dark eye heights, Rajputs, against whose valor once in a younger world, ruthless, unceasing vainly the mogul's hosts were hurled gray are our western daybreaks and gray are western skies and very cold the night watch unbroke by jackal's cries hard too will be the waiting you do not love to wait ay but the charge with bayonets they'll sound it soon or late and when that charge is sounded who'll heed gray skies and cold not you sikhs rajputs gurkhas if to one thought you hold if as you cross the open if as the foe you near if as you leap the trenches this thought is very clear these foes they are not sahibs they break the word they plight on babes their blades are wetted dead women know their might their princes are as sweepers whom none may touch or trust their gods they have forgotten their honor trails the dust all that they had of izat is trodden under heel into their hearts my brothers drive home drive home the steel august nineteen fourteen mena mena in that green land behind you the well-loved homesteads stand quiet as when you left them to spoil a little land and still your busy housewives sit knitting unafraid and still your children play as once the flemish children played in that green land behind you once you went forth to kill your maids await their lovers with hope their bosoms thrill o oh, lips too sweet almost to kiss o oh, eyes grown bright in vain so wait it many a flemish maid whom none shall kiss again in that green land behind you heard you a bugle call see you in dreams a writing form on every homestead wall what is yon cloud that grows and grows the cossacks ride that way pray that their hearts be not as yours if gods be left you pray
a legend of the fleet since nelson went to glory a hundred years ago no man can hear the story but still it makes him glow there's lots of old wiseacres longshoremen and headshakers who say we have none like him his like will never know and maybe they speak rightly for god himself you'd say would scarce start making lightly another piece of clay filled with his high devotions his brain that raced the oceans his heart of fire and swiftness that won trafalgar day yet on the other hand sirs there's some folks that declare strange stuff to tell on land sirs but sailormen they'll swear when nelson went to glory his heart for that's their story a fiery flung it to the fleet and still it's blazing there so when our grim gray cruisers nose out the skulking foe and beggars not being choosers their guns began to crow though nelson's gone to glory twill be the same old story his heart his heart will lead us and them that doubt will know the sea is his the sea is his he made it black gulf and sunlit shoal from barriered bight to where the long leagues of atlantic roll small strait and ceaseless ocean he bade each one to be the sea is his he made it and england keeps it free by pain and stress and striving beyond the nation's ken by vigils stern when others slept by many lives of men through nights of storm through dawnings blacker than midnights be this sea that god created england has kept it free count me the splendid captains who sailed with courage high to chart the perilous ways unknown tell me where these men lie to light a path for ships to come they moored at dead man's key the sea is god's he made it and these men made it free o little land of england o mother of hearts too brave men say this trust shall pass from thee who guardest nelson's grave ay but these braggarts yet shall learn who'd hold the world in fee the sea is god's and england england shall keep it free to the united states traitors have carried the word about that your hearts are cold with the doubt that kills fools as though you could sink to doubt you whom the name of freedom thrills they fear lest we plead with you by our blood to throb with england in this great fight caring no whit if the cause be good crying it's england's account it right nay but that call would be vain indeed not thus do brothers to brothers speak we shall not plead with you let them plead whose heel is set on the necks of the weak let them plead who have piled the dead league after league in that little land whose hands with the blood of babes are red red while they'd grasp you by the hand let them plead if for shame they dare whose honour is broke and their oaths forsworn we shall know by the blood we share the answer you cannot speak for scorn september nineteen fourteen the day how shall it break this dawn beyond forgetting out of grey sky shall just the same rose red signal a day like which ere its setting gave us the seas to hold and nelson dead then even as now strife filled the earth's four quarters and might seemed right and god was challenged then even as now upon the dim blue waters the fleet kept watch the fleet that nelson led dead is the admiral all the ships he won with are scrapped forgotten and the doubters say though he still lived his skill is past and done with and none may tell the outcome of this day since from high heaven itself death may come sailing suddenly and from water smooth and clear sharper than from a gun's mouth hell starts hailing and ere the foe be seen the doom is near ay but remember ye when doubts come creeping that not his sea craft only nelson left things nobler far he gave his men in keeping that should avail them though all else were reft things that time cannot fashion and unfashion the fearless faith that love of freedom gives the fire the inextinguishable passion the will to die so only england lives watch and ye will and pray no prayer forgetting 
for the brave hearts on yon dim waters rocked for fear not for the end of that sun setting the fire burns on faith wins god is not mocked england marching winter it's winter little greatest country black clouds keep piling up a bitter sky and the winds are screaming up from the cruel north line cold winds cold hearts winter is nigh other peoples great ones little greatest country marking all the storm signs and the tyrants waxing strong take fear to counsel and sound for a retiring sink on their knees and whimper lord how long you have never halted little greatest country though the foe ran ravening and all heaven was gray though cowards noisily twittered of disaster leaders hung back that should have shown the way on through the darkness little greatest country you have kept marching the men that you bore seemed their drums muffled their trumpets were they silent ah but the footbeats hear their ceaseless roar little greatest country never yet went army poor and so valiant crushed and so free though deadlier night disdaining the false captains marching marching to spring and victory december nineteen fourteen christmas nineteen fourteen let us forget at this sad christmas tide all but the babe who in his manger lay god's son who came that peace might reign alway and love be lord though him they crucified ay but he died not vainly cruelty died all down the ages and the babe held sway in true men's hearts so that the stronger they so much the more they crushed their strength and pride until a race that had forgot the christ arose saying behold we are mighty men as once of old let might be right again o oh, babe hath not thy life thy death sufficed let us forget nay let us rather wake and strike them down for christ's and all babe's sake end of section one Section 1 of War Poems and Other Verses by R. E. Vernhead. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War Poems, Part 1. To C. H. V. What shall I bring to you, wife of mine, when I come back from the war? A ribbon your dear brown hair to twine? A shawl from a Berlin store? Say, shall I choose you some prussian hack when the uhlans we overwhelm shall i bring you a potsdam goblet back and the crest from a prince's helm little you'd care what i laid at your feet ribbon or crest or shawl what if i bring you nothing sweet nor maybe come home at all ah but you'll know brave heart you'll know two things i'll have kept to send mine honour for which you bade me go and my love my love to the end. England to the sea. Hearken, O mother, hearken to thy daughter. Fain would I tell thee what men tell to me, saying that henceforth no more on any water shall I be first or great or loved or free, but that these others, so the tale is spoken, who have not known thee all these centuries by fire and sword shall yet turn England broken back from thy breast and beaten from thy seas me whom thou bearest where thy waves should guard me me whom thou suckledest on thy milk of foam me whom thy kisses shaped what while they marred me to whom thy storms are sweet and ring of home behold they cry she has grown soft and strengthless all her proud memories changed to fear and fret say thou who hast watched through ages that are lengthless whom have i feared and when did i forget what sons of mine have shunned thy worlds and races have i not reared for thee time and again and bid go forth to share thy fierce embraces sea ducks sea wolves sea rovers sea men names that thou knowest great hearts that thou holdest rocking them rocking them in an endless wake captains the world can match not with its boldest hawk howard 
Grenville, Frobisher, Drake? Nelson, the greatest of them all, the master who swept across thee like a shooting star, and while the earth stood veiled before disaster, caught death and slew him there at Trafalgar. Mother, they knew me then as thou didst know me. Then I cried, Peace, and every flag was furled. But I am old, it seems, and they would show me that never more my peace shall bind the world. Wherefore, O sea, I, standing thus before thee, stretch forth my hands unto thy surge, and say, When they come forth who seek this empire o'er thee, and I go forth to meet them, on that day God grant to us the old armata weather, the winds that rip, the heavens that stoop and lower. Not till the sea and England sink together shall they be masters. Let them boast that hour. August 1914 The Call Lad with the merry smile and the eyes quick as a hawk's and clear as the day, you who have counted the game the prize, here is the game of games to play. Never a goal, the captains say, matches the one that's needed now. Put the old blazer and cap away. England's colors await your brow. Man with the square-set jaws and chin, always it seems you have moved to your end, sure of yourself, intent to win. Fame and wealth and the power to bend, all that you made you're called to spend, all that you've sought you're asked to miss. What ambition compared with this, that a man lay down his life for his friend? Dreamer, oft in your glancing mind, brave with drinking the fairy brew, you have smitten the ogres blind when the fair princess cried out to you. Dreamer, what if your dreams are true? Yonder is a bayonet, magical, since him who it strikes the blade sinks through. Take it and strike for England, prince friend with a face so hard and worn the devil in you have sometimes met and now you curse the day you were born and want one boon of god to forget ah oh, but i know and yet and yet i think out there in the shrapnel spray you shall stand up and not regret the life that gave you so splendid a day lover of ease you've lolled and forgot all the things that you meant to write life has been soft for you has it not what offer does England make tonight? This, to toil and to march and to fight, as never you've dreamed since your life began. This, to carry the steel-swept height. This, to know you've played the man. Brothers, brothers, the time is short, nor soon again shall it so be tied, that a man may pass from the common sort, sudden and stand by the hero's side. Are there some that being named yet bide? Hark once more, to the clarion call sounded by him who deathless died this day england expects you all august nineteen fourteen the indian army into the west they are marching this is their longed-for day when that which england gave them they may at last repay when for the faith she dealt them peasants and priests and lords when for the love they bear her they shall unsheath their swords. Men of the plains and hillmen, men born to warrior roles, tall men of matchless ardor, small men with mighty souls, rulers alike and subjects, splendid the roll call rings, rajas and maharajas, kings and the sons of kings, Bikanir, Patiala, Rathlam, and Kishangar, Jodhpur, who rides the leopard down, Sashen and Kuch Bihar, from lands where skies are molten and suns strike down and parch, out of the east they're marching, into the west they march. O oh, little nimble Gurkhas, who won a hundred fights, O oh, Sikhs, the Sikhs who fail not upon the dark eye heights, Rajputs, against whose valor once in a younger world, ruthless, unceasing, vainly the Mughal's hosts were hurled. Gray are our western daybreaks, and gray are western skies and very cold the night watch unbroke by jackal's cries hard too will be the waiting you do not love to wait ay but the charge with bayonets they'll sound it soon or late and when that charge is sounded who'll heed gray skies and cold not you sikhs rajputs gurkhas 
if to one thought you hold if as you cross the open if as the foe you near if as you leap the trenches this thought is very clear these foes they are not sahibs they break the word they plight on babes their blades are wetted dead women know their might their princes are as sweepers whom none may touch or trust their gods they have forgotten their honor trails the dust all that they had of izat is trodden under heel into their hearts my brothers drive home drive home the steel august nineteen fourteen mena mena in that green land behind you the well-loved homesteads stand quiet as when you left them to spoil a little land and still your busy housewives sit knitting unafraid and still your children play as once the flemish children played in that green land behind you once you went forth to kill your maids await their lovers with hope their bosoms thrill o oh, lips too sweet almost to kiss o oh, eyes grown bright in vain so wait it many a flemish maid whom none shall kiss again in that green land behind you heard you a bugle call see you in dreams a writing form on every homestead wall what is yon cloud that grows and grows the cossacks ride that way pray that their hearts be not as yours if gods be left you pray a legend of the fleet since nelson went to glory a hundred years ago no man can hear the story but still it makes him glow there's lots of old wiseacres longshoremen and head shakers who say we have none like him his like will never know and maybe they speak rightly for god himself you'd say would scarce start making lightly another piece of clay filled with his high devotions his brain that raced the oceans his heart of fire and swiftness that one trafalgar day yet on the other hand sirs there's some folks that declare strange stuff to tell on land sirs but sailormen they'll swear when nelson went to glory his heart for that's their story a fire he flung it to the fleet and still it's blazing there so when our grim gray cruisers nose out the skulking foe and beggars not being choosers their guns began to crow though nelson's gone to glory twill be the same old story his heart his heart will lead us and them that doubt will know the sea is his the sea is his he made it black gulf and sunlit shoal from barriered bight to where the long leagues of atlantic roll small strait and ceaseless ocean he bade each one to be the sea is his he made it and england keeps it free by pain and stress and striving beyond the nation's ken by vigils stern when others slept by many lives of men through nights of storm through dawnings blacker than midnights be this sea that god created england has kept it free count me the splendid captains who sailed with courage high to chart the perilous ways unknown tell me where these men lie to light a path for ships to come they moored at dead man's key the sea is god's he made it and these men made it free o little land of england o mother of hearts too brave men say this trust shall pass from thee who guardest nelson's grave ay but these braggarts yet shall learn who'd hold the world in fee the sea is god's and england england shall keep it free to the united states traitors have carried the word about that your hearts are cold with the doubt that kills fools as though you could sink to doubt you whom the name of freedom thrills they fear lest we plead with you by our blood to throb with england in this great fight caring no whit if the cause be good crying it's england's account it right nay but that call would be vain indeed not thus do brothers to brothers speak we shall not plead with you let them plead whose heel is set on the necks of the weak let them plead who have piled the dead league after league in that little land whose hands with the blood of babes are red red while they'd grasp you by the hand let them plead if for shame they dare 
whose honour is broke and their oaths forsworn we shall know by the blood we share the answer you cannot speak for scorn september nineteen fourteen the day how shall it break this dawn beyond forgetting out of gray sky shall just the same rose red signal a day like which ere its setting gave us the seas to hold and nelson dead then even as now strife filled the earth's four quarters and might seemed right and god was challenged then even as now upon the dim blue waters the fleet kept watch the fleet that nelson led dead is the admiral all the ships he won with are scrapped forgotten and the doubters say though he still lived his skill is past and done with and none may tell the outcome of this day since from high heaven itself death may come sailing suddenly and from water smooth and clear sharper than from a gun's mouth hell starts hailing and ere the foe be seen the doom is near ay but remember ye when doubts come creeping that not his sea-craft only nelson left things nobler far he gave his men in keeping that should avail them though all else were reft things that time cannot fashion and unfashion the fearless faith that love of freedom gives the fire the inextinguishable passion the will to die so only england lives watch and ye will and pray no prayer forgetting for the brave hearts on yon dim waters rocked for fear not for the end of that sun setting the fire burns on faith wins god is not mocked england marching winter its winter little greatest country black clouds keep piling up a bitter sky and the winds are screaming up from the cruel north line cold winds cold hearts winter is nigh other peoples great ones little greatest country marking all the storm signs and the tyrants waxing strong take fear to counsel and sound for a retiring sink on their knees and whimper lord how long you have never halted little greatest country though the foe ran ravening and all heaven was gray though cowards noisily twittered of disaster leaders hung back that should have shown the way on through the darkness little greatest country you have kept marching the men that you bore seemed their drums muffled their trumpets were they silent ah but the footbeats hear their ceaseless roar little greatest country never yet went army poor and so valiant crushed and so free though deadlier night disdaining the false captains marching marching to spring and victory december nineteen fourteen christmas nineteen fourteen let us forget at this sad christmas tide all but the babe who in his manger lay god's son who came that peace might reign alway and love be lord though him they crucified ay but he died not vainly cruelty died all down the ages and the babe held sway in true men's hearts so that the stronger they so much the more they crushed their strength and pride until a race that had forgot the christ arose saying behold we are mighty men as once of old let might be right again o oh, babe hath not thy life thy death sufficed let us forget nay let us rather wake and strike them down for christ's and all babe's sake end of section one Section 1 of War Poems and Other Verses by R. E. Vernhead. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War Poems, Part 1. To C. H. V. What shall I bring to you, wife of mine, when I come back from the war? A ribbon your dear brown hair to twine? A shawl from a Berlin store? Say, shall I choose you some prussian hack when the uhlans we overwhelm shall i bring you a potsdam goblet back and the crest from a prince's helm little you'd care what i laid at your feet ribbon or crest or shawl what if i bring you nothing sweet nor maybe come home at all 
ah uh, but you'll know brave heart you'll know two things i'll have kept to send mine honour for which you bade me go and my love my love to the end england to the sea hearken o mother hearken to thy daughter fain would i tell thee what men tell to me saying that henceforth no more on any water shall i be first or great or loved or free but that these others so the tale is spoken who have not known thee all these centuries by fire and sword shall yet turn england broken back from thy breast and beaten from thy seas me whom thou bearest where thy wave should guard me me whom thou suckledest on thy milk of foam me whom thy kisses shaped what while they marred me to whom thy storms are sweet and ring of home behold they cried she has grown soft and strengthless all her proud memories changed to fear and fret say thou who hast watched through ages that are lengthless whom have i feared and when did i forget what sons of mine have shunned thy worlds and races have i not reared for thee time and again and bid go forth to share thy fierce embraces sea ducks sea wolves sea rovers sea men names that thou knowest great hearts that thou holdest rocking them rocking them in an endless wake captains the world can match not with its boldest hawk howard grenville frobisher drake nelson the greatest of them all the master who swept across thee like a shooting star and while the earth stood veiled before disaster caught death and slew him there at trafalgar mother they knew me then as thou didst know me then i cried peace and every flag was furled but i am old it seems and they would show me that never more my peace shall bind the world wherefore o sea i standing thus before thee stretch forth my hands unto thy surge and say when they come forth who seek this empire o'er thee and i go forth to meet them on that day god grant to us the old armata weather the winds that rip the heavens that stoop and lower not till the sea and england sink together shall they be masters let them boast that hour august nineteen fourteen the call lad with the merry smile and the eyes quick as a hawk's and clear as the day you who have counted the game the prize here is the game of games to play never a goal the captains say matches the one that's needed now put the old blazer and cap away england's colours await your brow man with the square-set jaws and chin always it seems you have moved to your end sure of yourself intent to win fame and wealth and the power to bend all that you made you're called to spend all that you've sought you're asked to miss what ambition compared with this that a man lay down his life for his friend dreamer oft in your glancing mind brave with drinking the fairy brew you have smitten the ogres blind when the fair princess cried out to you dreamer what if your dreams are true yonder is a bayonet magical since him who it strikes the blade sinks through take it and strike for england prince friend with a face so hard and worn the devil in you have sometimes met and now you curse the day you were born and want one boon of god to forget ah oh, but i know and yet and yet i think out there in the shrapnel spray you shall stand up and not regret the life that gave you so splendid a day lover of ease you've lolled and forgot all the things that you meant to write life has been soft for you has it not what offer does england make to-night this to toil and to march and to fight as never you've dreamed since your life began this to carry the steel-swept height this to know you played the man brothers brothers the time is short nor soon again shall it so be tied that a man may pass from the common sort sudden and stand by the hero's side are there some that being named yet bide hark once more to the clarion call sounded by him who deathless died this day england expects you all august nineteen fourteen
the indian army into the west they are marching this is their longed-for day when that which england gave them they may at last repay when for the faith she dealt them peasants and priests and lords when for the love they bear her they shall unsheath their swords men of the plains and hillmen men born to warrior roles tall men of matchless ardor small men with mighty souls rulers alike and subjects splendid the roll-call rings rajas and maharajas kings and the sons of kings bikanir patiala rathlam and kishangar jodhpur who rides the leopard down sashen and kuch bihar from lands where skies are molten and suns strike down and parch out of the east they're marching into the west they march o little nimble gurkhas who won a hundred fights o sikhs the sikhs who fail not upon the dark eye heights rajputs against whose valour once in a younger world ruthless unceasing vainly the mogul's hosts were hurled grey are our western daybreaks and grey are western skies and very cold the night watch unbroke by jackals cries hard too will be the waiting you do not love to wait ay but the charge with bayonets they'll sound it soon or late and when that charge is sounded who'll heed grey skies and cold not you sikhs rajputs gurkhas if to one thought you hold if as you cross the open if as the foe you near if as you leap the trenches this thought is very clear these foes they are not sahibs they break the word they plight on babes their blades are wetted dead women know their might their princes are as sweepers whom none may touch or trust their gods they have forgotten their honour trails the dust all that they had of izat is trodden under heel into their hearts my brothers drive home drive home the steel august nineteen fourteen mena mena in that green land behind you the well-loved homesteads stand quiet as when you left them to spoil a little land and still your busy housewives sit knitting unafraid and still your children play as once the flemish children played in that green land behind you once you went forth to kill your maids await their lovers with hope their bosoms thrill o lips too sweet almost to kiss o eyes grown bright in vain so wait it many a flemish maid whom none shall kiss again in that green land behind you heard you a bugle call see you in dreams a writing form on every homestead wall what is yon cloud that grows and grows the cossacks ride that way pray that their hearts be not as yours if gods be left you pray a legend of the fleet since nelson went to glory a hundred years ago no man can hear the story but still it makes him glow there's lots of old wiseacres longshoremen and head shakers who say we have none like him his like will never know and maybe they speak rightly for god himself you'd say would scarce start making lightly another piece of clay filled with his high devotions his brain that raced the oceans his heart of fire and swiftness that one trafalgar day yet on the other hand sirs there's some folks that declare strange stuff to tell on land sirs but sailormen they'll swear when nelson went to glory his heart for that's their story a fiery flung it to the fleet and still it's blazing there so when our grim grey cruisers nose out the skulking foe and beggars not being choosers their guns began to crow though nelson's gone to glory twill be the same old story his heart his heart will lead us and them that doubt will know the sea is his the sea is his he made it black gulf and sunlit shoal from barriered bight to where the long leagues of atlantic roll small strait and ceaseless ocean he bade each one to be the sea is his he made it and england keeps it free by pain and stress and striving beyond the nation's ken by vigils stern when others slept by many lives of men 
through nights of storm through dawnings blacker than midnights be this sea that god created england has kept it free count me the splendid captains who sailed with courage high to chart the perilous ways unknown tell me where these men lie to light a path for ships to come they moored at dead man's key the sea is god's he made it and these men made it free o little land of england o mother of hearts too brave men say this trust shall pass from thee who guardest nelson's grave ay but these braggarts yet shall learn who'd hold the world in fee the sea is god's and england england shall keep it free to the united states traitors have carried the word about that your hearts are cold with the doubt that kills fools as though you could sink to doubt you whom the name of freedom thrills they fear lest we plead with you by our blood to throb with england in this great fight caring no whit if the cause be good crying it's england's account it right nay but that call would be vain indeed not thus do brothers to brothers speak we shall not plead with you let them plead whose heel is set on the necks of the weak let them plead who have piled the dead league after league in that little land whose hands with the blood of babes are red red while they'd grasp you by the hand let them plead if for shame they dare whose honour is broke and their oaths forsworn we shall know by the blood we share the answer you cannot speak for scorn september nineteen fourteen the day how shall it break this dawn beyond forgetting out of gray sky shall just the same rose red signal a day like which ere its setting gave us the seas to hold and nelson dead then even as now strife filled the earth's four quarters and might seemed right and god was challenged then even as now upon the dim blue waters the fleet kept watch the fleet that nelson led dead is the admiral all the ships he won with are scrapped forgotten and the doubters say though he still lived his skill is past and done with and none may tell the outcome of this day since from high heaven itself death may come sailing suddenly and from water smooth and clear sharper than from a gun's mouth hell starts hailing and ere the foe be seen the doom is near ay but remember ye when doubts come creeping that not his sea craft only nelson left things nobler far he gave his men in keeping that should avail them though all else were reft things that time cannot fashion and unfashion the fearless faith that love of freedom gives the fire the inextinguishable passion the will to die so only england lives watch and ye will and pray no prayer forgetting for the brave hearts on yon dim waters rocked for fear not for the end of that sun setting the fire burns on faith wins god is not mocked england marching winter its winter little greatest country black clouds keep piling up a bitter sky and the winds are screaming up from the cruel north line cold winds cold hearts winter is nigh other peoples great ones little greatest country marking all the storm signs and the tyrants waxing strong take fear to counsel and sound for a retiring sink on their knees and whimper lord how long you have never halted little greatest country though the foe ran raveny and all heaven was gray though cowards noisily twittered of disaster leaders hung back that should have shown the way on through the darkness little greatest country you have kept marching the men that you bore seemed their drums muffled their trumpets were they silent ah but the footbeats hear their ceaseless roar little greatest country never yet went army poor and so valiant crushed and so free though deadlier night disdaining the false captains marching marching to spring and victory december nineteen fourteen christmas nineteen fourteen let us forget at this sad christmas tide all but the babe who in his manger lay 
god's son who came that peace might reign alway and love be lord though him they crucified ay but he died not vainly cruelty died all down the ages and the babe held sway in true men's hearts so that the stronger they so much the more they crushed their strength and pride until a race that had forgot the christ arose saying behold we are mighty men as once of old let might be right again o oh, babe hath not thy life thy death sufficed let us forget nay let us rather wake and strike them down for christ and all babe's sake end of section one Section 2 of War Poems and Other Verses by Robert Ernest Bernhead. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War Poems, Part 2 Beyond the Pale After reading the French evidence of the German atrocities As men who in some hideous juju place Have found a naked ape with brutish tread But once they knew, before his reason fled, Decent and sane, a white man of their race, will close their eyes in horror for a space, then for sheer pity's sake, with no word said, since no word may avail, will strike him dead, and strive thereafter to forget his face. So with these ravening brutes that once were men, a loathing world has held a while its hand, unable to believe such things could be, now, lest such baseness should be seen again let it in mercy flame across their land and sweep them to oblivion utterly to our fallen ye sleepers who will sing you who can but give our tears ye dead men who shall bring you fame in the coming years brave souls but who remembers the flame that fired your embers deep deep the sleep that holds you who one time had no peers yet maybe fame's but seeming and praise yet set aside content to go on dreaming yea happy to have died if of all things you prayed for all things your valour paid for one prayer is not forgotten one purchase not denied but god grants your dear england a strength that shall not cease till she have won for all the earth from ruthless men release and made supreme upon her mercy and truth and honour is this the thing you died for? O oh, brothers, sleep and peace. December 1914 To Canada Canada, Canada, is not thy face most fair? Is there a land men know fairer than thee? Where is heaven half so vast, or blows a lovelier air? What are thy sons doing here o'er the sea? Have they forgot thy great hills and thy crystal-clear streams and deep woods and rich fields that they come? Are not their women loved? Are not their children dear? Why do they march at the roll of the drum? Chill are the Belgian dunes, clammy the night wind's breath, always the livid mist from the mares creep. Who takes the roads of France, marches alongside death? Are thy sons weary to try the last sleep? Ah, but thou knowest well, Canada, Canada, sweet every inch of thee, dears every call, came but a cry from thee, every man's heart would stir, only thine honour is dearest of all. And they have sworn, thy sons, when thou art mightier yet, no man shall point at thee, none shall dare say, when in the war of worlds cruelty and justice met, men of the maple hung back from the fray. So where the bugles call, there where the thin lines reel, far from the land where their homes and hearts be, stalwart and terrible, into the hail of steel, Canada, lo, they are marching for thee. The Little Army It's true that hordes of British, ne'er by tyrants' wills were hurled, thicker than any locust swarm, to devastate the world. But when those tyrants' legions passed, or painfully withdrew our little army still marched it did at waterloo no british attila is found upon our scroll of fame a thing few englishmen regret we never liked the name but where in some walhalla hall 
the great dead captains meet it's odds if wellington stands down or marlborough lacks a seat why would they small their armies maybe were but none would call the battles they fought little ones the victories they won small seeing that ere they left the field whate'er their toll might be kings had gone down and emperors given up their empery nay take a map and count the spots where this small force made shift blenheim the doro quatre bras alma quebec rourke's drift mark that long road they trudged adown the endless afghan nights see where at a sick hero's word they climbed the abraham's heights let others count their men by hordes we count them one by one and many a warrior doffed his shoes before john nicholson and many a slave bowed down his head and wept to know his doom when gordon stood and faced the pack that roared into khartoum o warlord of the western huns that army of sir john's your legions know it do they not they drove it back from mons twas small enough too small perhaps the british line is thin it won't seem quite so little when it's marching through berlin nineteen fifteen the little sergeant sergeant blank the rifle brigade he was one of the bugler lads born in the army and bred also and they gave him the stripes that had been his dad's for knowing what soldiers ought to know and then you'd see him swanky and small drilling grown men of twice his span dressing them down and telling them all that the british army teaches a man left right left how he'd make them run all for their good as he let them see it's the way the army has always done don't argue the point he'd say with me sometimes they groused but mostly they laughed for there wasn't a job but he bore the brunt and when the time came there was never a draft smarter his when he went to the front somewhere in france on a night of drench when their guns had pounded the line to hell the germans rushed what had been a trench and the sergeant's men and the sergeant fell light in some boche i'm sure he'd let before they'd count him as reached full stop and if there was breath in him then i bet he told em why england would come out top swanky and small and full of guts i wonder now that he's out at the fight down what dark alleys his small ghost struts giving his men left right left right there where the darkening shadows fall i think i can hear him chanting slow the british army's the best of all don't argue the point i ought to know to f g s seriously wounded peaks that you dreamed of hills your heart has climbed on never your feet shall climb your eyes shall see all your life long you must tread lowly places limping for england well so let it be we know your heart's too high for any grudging more than she asked you gladly gave to her who though its streets you'll tramp instead of snowfields you'll be the cheeriest as you always were yes and you'll shoulder all our packs we know you and none will guess you're wearied night or day yes you'll lift lots of lame dogs over fences who might have lifted you for that's your way all your life long no matter so you've chosen pity you never that were waste indeed who up hills higher than the alps you loved so all your life long will point the way and lead before the assault if through this roar o oh, the guns one prayer may reach thee lord of all life whose mercies never sleep not in our time not now lord we beseech thee to grant us peace the sword has bit too deep we may not rest we hear the wail of mothers mourning the sons who fill some nameless grave past us in dreams the ghosts march of our brothers who are most valiant whom we could not save we may not rest what though our eyes beholden in sleep we see dear eyes yet wet with tears and locks that once were oh so fair and golden grown gray in hours more pitiless than years we see all fair things fouled homes love's hands builded shattered to dust beside their withered vines shattered the towers that once thy sunsets gilded 
and christ struck yet again within his shrines over them hangs the dust of death beside them the dead lie countless and the foe laughs still we may not rest while those cruel mouths deride them we who were proud yet could not work thy will we have failed we have been more weak than these betrayers in strength or in faith we have failed our pride was vain how can we rest who have not yet slain the slayers what peace for us who have seen thy children slain hark the roar grows the thunders reawaken we ask one thing lord only one thing now hearts high as theirs who went to death unshaken courage like theirs to make and keep their vow to stay not till these hosts whom mercies harden who know no glory save of sword and fire find in our fire the splendor of thy pardon meet from our steel the mercy they desire then to our children there shall be no handing of fate so vain of passion so abhorred but peace the peace which passeth understanding not in our time but in their time o lord december nineteen sixteen a petition all that a man might ask thou hast given me england birthright and happy childhood's long hard seas and love whose range is deep beyond all sounding and wider than all seas a heart to front the world and find god in it eyes blind enow but not too blind to see the lovely things behind the dross and darkness and lovelier things to be and friends whose loyalty time nor death shall weaken and quenchless hope and laughter's golden store all that a man might ask thou hast given me england yet grant thou one thing more that now an envious foes would spoil thy splendor unversed in arms a dreamer such as i may in thy ranks be deemed not all unworthy england for thee to die at delville at delville i lost three sergeants and never within my ken had one of them taken thought for his life or cover for aught but his men not for two years of fighting through that devilish strain and noise yet one of them called out as he died i've been so ambitious boys and i thought to myself ambitious did he mean that he longed for power but i knew that he never thought of himself saving in his dying hour and one left a note for his mother saying he gladly died for england and wished no better thing how she must weep with pride and one would never a word fell talking's the one thing he'd shirk but i never knew him other than keen for things like danger and work those sergeants i lost at delville on a night that was cruel and black they gave their lives for england's sake they will never come back what of the hundreds in whose hearts thoughts no less splendid burn i wonder what england will do for them if ever they return a listening post the sun's a red ball in the oak and all the grass is gray with dew a while ago a blackbird spoke he didn't know the world's askew and yonder rifleman and i wait here behind the misty trees to shoot the first man that goes by our rifles ready on our knees how could he know that if we fail the world may lie in chains for years and england be a bygone tale and right be wrong and laughter tears strange that this bird sits there and sings while we must only sit and plan who are so much the higher things to murder our fellow man but maybe god will cause to be who brought forth sweetness from the strong out of our discords harmony sweeter than that bird's song a trench ditty when the war is over and the fun is wearing thin of brightly doing goose steps down the alleys of berlin i'll find some german ulan twist his helmet off his head and throw in my puttees what's left to wear around instead and i'll march into the station and address the booking clerk on billet for old england look sharp you frightful turk for i've had enough of boches and i've shot a handsome few look sharp you ruddy strafer or i may be shooting you he'll find a ticket fast enough 
and fust class i'll go back with my feet upon the cushions and my rifle on the rack and when i gets to england why i'll marry some sweet maid and tell her ow we crossed the rhine and what the prussians paid every night for luck i'll drink afore i go to bed a pint from out that helmet that once squeezed the ullen's head and on the kaiser's birthday i will send to keep em keen a card with god strafe england on and what price saint helene when the war is over that's the kind of course i'll steer but it ain't over yet my lad so eve that sandbag ear the infantryman i wish i had entered the navy it's damp when the decks are awash but the appy a b unlike you and me ain't always knee-deep in the slosh i wish i had signed as a birdman tain't nice to fall out of the sky but he has got the fun of observin a uh un -uh, afore he gets nicked in the eye i wish i had gone for the cavalry there's yourself and a orse to keep neat but it must save some trouble if your orse does the double when you're launched on a rutty retreat i wish i had tried anti-aircraft it's hard to get off your armchair when a zeppelin blows by but i'd have a good try to drill a thick hole in the air i wish i had joined the staff college they work at the juice of a pace drawer and maps regular rippers fetching generals their slippers but you can use your brains at the base i wish i'd applied for munitions you'd see me do half weekly spells no unions i'd worry by being in a hurry no i'd get the v c making shells but i've been and entered the infantry and i lives like an eel in the slosh damn fool did you say lad well any old way lad it's we that gets quits with the bush the sergeant the sergeant as is useless i used to doubt of it he did not like the way i washed his head seemed bulged a bit my arms drill seemed to hurt him he'd swear and close his eyes and when i had no time to shave he would not sympathize at home in good old england when dealing with recruits he seemed to eye his better self they had dirty boots but in this trench a sittin all crouched upon my joints i do not mind admittin the sergeant has its points he's just been round explainin that jumpin up to see if shells is goin to burst your way is waste of energy shells though you can't believe it aren't always aimed at you but snipers if they see your ed will put a bullet through his words about the boches is also comforting he says as good a shot as me could do a dozen in and if it came to bayonets i'd easy stick a score the way i fight i never knew he thought me smart before and always he says lad mind this we're going to win it's no use thinking gloomy thoughts whatever fix you're in suppose we did get out it england would not forget and where's the man that is a man that would not die for that august nineteen sixteen End of section two. Section two of War Poems and Other Verses by Robert Ernest Vernhead. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War Poems, Part Two. Beyond the Pale. After reading the French evidence of the German atrocities. As men who in some hideous juju place have found a naked ape with brutish tread and once they knew before his reason fled decent and sane a white man of their race will close their eyes in horror for a space then for sheer pity's sake with no word said since no word may avail will strike him dead and strive thereafter to forget his face so with these ravening brutes that once were men a loathing world has held a while its hand unable to believe such things could be now lest such baseness should be seen again let it in mercy flame across their land and sweep them to oblivion utterly to our fallen ye sleepers who will sing you who can but give our tears ye dead men who shall bring you fame in the coming years brave souls but who remembers the flame that fired your embers deep deep the sleep that holds you who one time had no peers yet maybe fame's but seeming and 
praise yet set aside content to go on dreaming yea happy to have died if of all things you prayed for all things your valour paid for one prayer is not forgotten one purchase not denied but god grants your dear england a strength that shall not cease till she have won for all the earth from ruthless men release and made supreme upon her mercy and truth and honour is this the thing you died for o brothers sleep and peace december nineteen fourteen to canada 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 is not thy face most fair is there a land men know fairer than thee where is heaven half so vast where blows a lovelier air what are thy sons doing here o'er the sea have they forgot thy great hills and thy crystal clear streams and deep woods and rich field that they come are not their women loved are not their children dear why do they march at the roll of the drum chill are the belgian dunes clammy the night wind's breath always the livid mist from the mares creep who takes the roads of france marches alongside death are thy sons weary to try the last sleep ah but thou knowest well canada canada sweet every inch of thee dears every call came but a cry from thee every man's heart would stir only thine honour is dearest of all and they have sworn thy sons when thou art mightier yet no man shall point at thee none shall dare say when in the war of worlds cruelty and justice met men of the maple hung back from the fray so where the bugles call there where the thin lines reel far from the land where their homes and hearts be stalwart and terrible into the hail of steel canada lo they are marching for thee the little army it's true that hordes of british ne'er by tyrants wills were hurled thicker than any locust swarm to devastate the world but when those tyrants legions passed or painfully withdrew our little army still marched it did at waterloo no british attila is found upon our scroll of fame a thing few englishmen regret we never liked the name but where in some walhalla hall the great dead captains meet it's odds if wellington stands down or marlborough lacks a seat why would they small their armies maybe were but none would call the battles they fought little ones the victories they won small seeing that ere they left the field whate'er their toll might be kings had gone down and emperors given up their empery nay take a map and count the spots where this small force made shift blenheim the doro quatre bras alma quebec rourke's drift mark that long road they trudged adown the endless afghan nights see where at a sick hero's word they climbed the abraham's heights let others count their men by hordes we count them one by one and many a warrior doffed his shoes before john nicholson and many a slave bowed down his head and wept to know his doom when gordon stood and faced the pack that roared into khartoum o warlord of the western huns that army of sir john's your legions know it do they not they drove it back from mons twas small enough too small perhaps the british line is thin it won't seem quite so little when it's marching through berlin nineteen fifteen the little sergeant sergeant blank the rifle brigade he was one of the bugler lads born in the army and bred also and they gave him the stripes that had been his dad's for knowing what soldiers ought to know and then you'd see him swanky and small drilling grown men of twice his span dressing them down and telling them all that the british army teaches a man left right left how he'd make them run all for their good as he let them see it's the way the army has always done don't argue the point he'd say with me sometimes they groused but mostly they laughed for there wasn't a job but he bore the brunt and when the time came there was never a draft smarter his when he went to the front somewhere in france on a night of drench when their guns had pounded the line to hell 
the germans rushed what had been a trench and the sergeant's men and the sergeant fell light and some boche i'm sure he'd let before they'd count him as reached full stop and if there was breath in him then i bet he told em why england would come out top swanky and small and full of guts i wonder now that he's out at the fight down what dark alleys his small ghost struts giving his men left right left right there where the darkening shadows fall i think i can hear him chanting slow the british army's the best of all don't argue the point i ought to know to f g s seriously wounded peaks that you dreamed of hills your heart has climbed on never your feet shall climb your eyes shall see all your life long you must tread lowly places limping for england well so let it be we know your heart's too high for any grudging more than she asked you gladly gave to her who though its streets you'll tramp instead of snowfields you'll be the cheeriest as you always were yes and you'll shoulder all our packs we know you and none will guess your wearied night or day yes you'll lift lots of lame dogs over fences who might have lifted you for that's your way all your life long no matter so you've chosen pity you never that were waste indeed who up hills higher than the alps you loved so all your life long will point the way and lead before the assault if through this roar o oh, the guns one prayer may reach thee lord of all life whose mercies never sleep not in our time not now lord we beseech thee to grant us peace the sword has bit too deep we may not rest we hear the wail of mothers mourning the sons who fill some nameless grave past us in dreams the ghosts march of our brothers who were most valiant whom we could not save we may not rest what though our eyes be holden in sleep we see dear eyes yet wet with tears and locks that once were oh so fair and golden grown gray in hours more pitiless than years we see all fair things fouled homes love's hands builded shattered to dust beside their withered vines shattered the towers that once thy sunsets gilded and christ struck yet again within his shrines over them hangs the dust of death beside them the dead lie countless and the foe laughs still we may not rest while those cruel mouths deride them we who were proud yet could not work thy will we have failed we have been more weak than these betrayers in strength or in faith we have failed our pride was vain how can we rest who have not yet slain the slayers what peace for us who have seen thy children slain hark the roar grows the thunders reawaken we ask one thing lord only one thing now hearts high as theirs who went to death unshaken courage like theirs to make and keep their vow to stay not till these hosts whom mercies harden who know no glory save of sword and fire find in our fire the splendour of thy pardon meet from our steel the mercy they desire then to our children there shall be no handing of fate so vain of passion so abhorred but peace the peace which passeth understanding not in our time but in their time o lord december nineteen sixteen a petition all that a man might ask thou hast given me england birthright and happy childhood's long heart's ease and love whose range is deep beyond all sounding and wider than all seas a heart to front the world and find god in it eyes blind now, but not too blind to see the lovely things behind the dross and darkness and lovelier things to be and friends whose loyalty time nor death shall weaken and quenchless hope and laughter's golden store all that a man might ask thou hast given me england yet grant thou one thing more that now an envious foes would spoil thy splendour unversed in arms a dreamer such as i may in thy ranks be deemed not all unworthy england for thee to die at delville at delville i lost three sergeants 
and never within my ken had one of them taken thought for his life or cover for aught but his men not for two years of fighting through that devilish strain and noise yet one of them called out as he died i've been so ambitious boys and i thought to myself ambitious did he mean that he longed for power but i knew that he never thought of himself saving in his dying hour the one left a note for his mother saying he gladly died for england and wished no better thing how she must weep with pride and one with never a word fell talking's the one thing he'd shirk but i never knew him other than keen for things like danger and work those sergeants i lost at delville on a night that was cruel and black they gave their lives for england's sake they will never come back what of the hundreds in whose hearts thoughts no less splendid burn i wonder what england will do for them if ever they return a listening post the sun's a red ball in the oak and all the grass is gray with dew a while ago a blackbird spoke he didn't know the world's askew and yonder rifleman and i wait here behind the misty trees to shoot the first man that goes by our rifles ready on our knees how could he know that if we fail the world may lie in chains for years and england be a bygone tale and right be wrong and laughter tears strange that this bird sits there and sings while we must only sit and plan who are so much the higher things to murder our fellow man but maybe god will cause to be who brought forth sweetness from the strong out of our discords harmony sweeter than that bird's song a trench ditty when the war is over and the fun is wearing thin of brightly doing goose steps down the alleys of berlin i'll find some german ulan twist his helmet off his head and throw in my puttees what's left to wear around instead and i'll march into the station and address the booking clerk on billet for old england look sharp you frightful turk for i've had enough of boches and i've shot a handsome few look sharp you ruddy strafer or i may be shootin you you'll find a ticket fast enough and fust class i'll go back with my feet upon the cushions and my rifle on the rack and when i gets to england why i'll marry some sweet maid and tell her ow we crossed the rhine and what the prussians paid every night for luck i'll drink afore i go to bed a pint from out that helmet that once squeezed the ullen's head and on the kaiser's birthday i will send to keep em keen a card with god strafe england on and what price saint helene when the war is over that's the kind of course i'll steer but it ain't over yet my lad so eve that sandbag ear the infantryman i wish i had entered the navy it's damp when the decks are awash but the appy a b unlike you and me ain't always knee deep in the slosh i wish i had signed as a birdman tain't nice to fall out of the sky but he has got the fun of observin a un afore he gets nicked in the eye i wish i had gone for the cavalry there's yourself and a orse to keep neat but it must save some trouble if your orse does the double when you're launched on a rutty retreat i wish i had tried anti-aircraft it's hard to get off your armchair when a zeppelin blows by but i'd have a good try to drill a thick hole in the air i wish i had joined the staff college they work at the juice of a pace drawer and maps regular rippers fetching generals their slippers but you can use your brains at the base i wish i'd applied for munitions you'd see me do half weekly spells no unions i'd worry by being in a hurry no i'd get the v c making shells but i've been and entered the infantry and i lives like an eel in the slosh damn fool did you say lad well any old way lad it's we that gets quits with the bosch the sergeant the sergeant as is useless i used to doubt of it he did not like the way i washed his head seemed bulged a bit my arms drill seemed to hurt him he'd swear and close his eyes and when i had no time to shave he would not sympathize 
at home in good old England, when dealing with recruits, he seemed to eye his better self they at dirty boots. But in this trench of sitting, all crouched upon my joints, I do not mind admitting the sergeant as its points. He's just been round explaining that jumping up to see if shells is going to burst your way is waste of energy. Shells, though you can't believe it, aren't always aimed at you. But snipers, if they see your head, will put a bullet through. His words about the Boches is also comforting. He says as good a shot as me could do a dozen in. And if it came to bayonets, I'd easy stick a score the way I fight. I never knew he thought me smart before. And always, he says, lad, mind this, we're going to win. It's no use thinking gloomy thoughts, whatever fix you're in. Suppose we did get out it. England would not forget. And where's the man that is a man that would not die for that? August 1916 End of section 2《Section Two of War Poems and Other Verses》by Robert Ernest Vanhead. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War Poems, Part Two. Beyond the Pale. After reading the French evidence of the German atrocities. As men who in some hideous juju place have found a naked ape with brutish tread, but once they knew before his reason fled, decent and sane a white man of their race, will close their eyes in horror for a space. Then, for sheer pity's sake, with no word said, since no word may avail, will strike him dead, and strive thereafter to forget his face. So with these ravening brutes that once were men, a loathing world has held a while its hand, unable to believe such things could be, now, lest such baseness should be seen again. Let it in mercy flame across their land, and sweep them to oblivion utterly. To our fallen. Ye sleepers, who will sing you? Who can but give our tears? Ye dead men, who shall bring you fame in the coming years? Brave souls, but who remembers the flame that fired your embers? Deep, deep the sleep that holds you, who one time had no peers. Yet maybe fame's but seeming, and praise yet set aside, content to go on dreaming. Yea, happy to have died, if of all things you prayed for, all things your valor paid for. One prayer is not forgotten, one purchase not denied. But God grants your dear England a strength that shall not cease, till she have won for all the earth from ruthless men release, and made supreme upon her mercy and truth and honor. Is this the thing you died for? O brothers, sleep and peace. December 1914 To Canada Canada, Canada, is not thy face most fair? Is there a land men know fairer than thee? Where is heaven half so vast, where blows a lovelier air? What are thy sons doing here o'er the sea? Have they forgot thy great hills and thy crystal-clear streams and deep woods and rich field that they come? Are not their women loved? Are not their children dear? Why do they march at the roll of the drum? Chill are the Belgian dunes. Clammy the night wind's breath, always the livid mist from the mares creep. Who takes the roads of France, marches alongside death. Are thy sons weary to try the last sleep? Ah, but thou knowest well, Canada, Canada, sweet every inch of thee, dears every call, came but a cry from thee, every man's heart would stir, only thine honor is dearest of all. And they have sworn, thy sons, when thou art mightier yet, no man shall point at thee, none shall dare say, when in the war of worlds cruelty and justice met, men of the maple hung back from the fray. So where the bugles call, there where the thin lines reel, far from the land where their homes and hearts be, stalwart and terrible, into the hail of steel, Canada, lo, they are marching for thee. The Little Army It's true that hordes of British, ne'er by tyrants' wills were hurled, 
thicker than any locust swarm to devastate the world but when those tyrants legions passed or painfully withdrew our little army still marched it did at waterloo no british attila is found upon our scroll of fame a thing few englishmen regret we never liked the name but where in some walhalla hall the great dead captains meet it's odds if wellington stands down or marlborough lacks a seat why would they small their armies maybe were but none would call the battles they fought little ones the victories they won small seeing that ere they left the field whate'er their toll might be kings had gone down and emperors given up their empery nay take a map and count the spots where this small force made shift blenheim the doro quatre bras alma quebec rourke's drift mark that long road they trudged adown the endless afghan nights see where at a sick hero's word they climbed the abraham's heights let others count their men by hordes we count them one by one and many a warrior doffed his shoes before john nicholson and many a slave bowed down his head and wept to know his doom when gordon stood and faced the pack that roared into khartoum o warlord of the western huns that army of sir john's your legions know it do they not they drove it back from mons twas small enough too small perhaps the british line is thin it won't seem quite so little when it's marching through berlin nineteen fifteen the little sergeant sergeant blank the rifle brigade he was one of the bugler lads born in the army and bred also and they gave him the stripes that had been his dad's for knowing what soldiers ought to know and then you'd see him swanky and small drilling grown men of twice his span dressing them down and telling them all that the british army teaches a man left right left how he'd make them run all for their good as he let them see it's the way the army has always done don't argue the point he'd say with me sometimes they groused but mostly they laughed for there wasn't a job but he bore the brunt and when the time came there was never a draft smarter his when he went to the front somewhere in france on a night of drench when their guns had pounded the line to hell the germans rushed what had been a trench and the sergeant's men and the sergeant fell light in some boche i'm sure he'd let before they'd count him as reached full stop and if there was breath in him then i bet he told em why england would come out top swanky and small and full of guts i wonder now that he's out at the fight down what dark alleys his small ghost struts giving his men left right left right there where the darkening shadows fall i think i can hear him chanting slow the british army's the best of all don't argue the point i ought to know to f g s seriously wounded peaks that you dreamed of hills your heart has climbed on never your feet shall climb your eyes shall see all your life long you must tread lowly places limping for england well so let it be we know your heart's too high for any grudging more than she asked you gladly gave to her who though its streets you'll tramp instead of snowfields you'll be the cheeriest as you always were yes and you'll shoulder all our packs we know you and none will guess you're wearied night or day yes you'll lift lots of lame dogs over fences who might have lifted you for that's your way all your life long no matter so you've chosen pity you never that were waste indeed who up hills higher than the alps you loved so all your life long will point the way and lead before the assault if through this roar o oh, the guns one prayer may reach thee lord of all life whose mercies never sleep not in our time not now lord we beseech thee to grant us peace the sword has bit too deep we may not rest we hear the wail of mothers mourning the sons who fill some nameless grave past us in dreams the ghosts march of our brothers who are most valiant whom we could not save we may not rest 
what though our eyes beholden in sleep we see dear eyes yet wet with tears and locks that once were oh so fair and golden grown gray in hours more pitiless than years we see all fair things fouled homes love's hands builded shattered to dust beside their withered vines shattered the towers that once thy sunsets gilded and christ struck yet again within his shrines over them hangs the dust of death beside them the dead lie countless and the foe laughs still we may not rest while those cruel mouths deride them we who were proud yet could not work thy will we have failed we have been more weak than these betrayers in strength or in faith we have failed our pride was vain how can we rest who have not yet slain the slayers what peace for us who have seen thy children slain hark the roar grows the thunders reawaken we ask one thing lord only one thing now hearts high as theirs who went to death unshaken courage like theirs to make and keep their vow to stay not till these hosts whom mercies harden who know no glory save a sword and fire find in our fire the splendor of thy pardon meet from our steel the mercy they desire then to our children there shall be no handing of fate so vain of passion so abhorred but peace the peace which passeth understanding not in our time but in their time o lord december nineteen sixteen a petition all that a man might ask thou hast given me england birthright and happy childhood's long heart's ease and love whose range is deep beyond all sounding and wider than all seas a heart to front the world and find god in it eyes blind enow but not too blind to see the lovely things behind the dross and darkness and lovelier things to be and friends whose loyalty time nor death shall weaken and quenchless hope and laughter's golden store all that a man might ask thou hast given me england yet grant thou one thing more that now an envious foes would spoil thy splendor unversed in arms a dreamer such as i may in thy ranks be deemed not all unworthy england for thee to die at delville at delville i lost three sergeants and never within my ken had one of them taken thought for his life or cover for aught but his men not for two years of fighting through that devilish strain and noise yet one of them called out as he died i've been so ambitious boys and i thought to myself ambitious did he mean that he longed for power but i knew that he never thought of himself saving in his dying hour and one left a note for his mother saying he gladly died for england and wished no better thing how she must weep with pride and one with never a word fell talking the one thing he'd shirk but i never knew him other than keen for things like danger and work those sergeants i lost at delville on a night that was cruel and black they gave their lives for england's sake they will never come back what of the hundreds in whose hearts thoughts no less splendid burn i wonder what england will do for them if ever they return a listening post the sun's a red ball in the oak and all the grass is gray with dew a while ago a blackbird spoke he didn't know the world's askew and yonder rifleman and i wait here behind the misty trees to shoot the first man that goes by our rifles ready on our knees how could he know that if we fail the world may lie in chains for years and england be a bygone tale and right be wrong and laughter tears strange that this bird sits there and sings while we must only sit and plan who are so much the higher things to murder our fellow man but maybe god will cause to be who brought forth sweetness from the strong out of our discords harmony sweeter than that bird's song a trench ditty when the war is over and the fun is wearing thin of brightly doing goose steps down the alleys of berlin i'll find some german ulan 
twist his helmet off his head and throw in my puttees what's left to wear around instead and i'll march into the station and address the booking clerk unbill it for old england look sharp you frightful turk for i've had enough of boches and i've shot a handsome few look sharp you ruddy strafer or i may be shootin you you'll find a ticket fast enough and fust class i'll go back with my feet upon the cushions and my rifle on the rack and when i gets to england why i'll marry some sweet maid and tell her ow we crossed the rhine and what the prussians paid every night for luck i'll drink afore i go to bed a pint from out that helmet that once squeezed the ullen's ed and on the kaiser's birthday i will send to keep em keen a card with god strafe england on and what price saint helene when the war is over that's the kind of course i'll steer but it ain't over yet my lad so eve that sandbag ear the infantryman i wish i had entered the navy it's damp when the decks are awash but the appy a b unlike you and me ain't always knee deep in the slosh i wish i had signed as a birdman tain't nice to fall out of the sky but he has got the fun of observin a uh un -uh, afore he gets nicked in the eye i wish i had gone for the cavalry there's yourself and a horse to keep neat but it must save some trouble if your horse does the double when you're launched on a rutty retreat i wish i had tried anti-aircraft it's hard to get off your armchair when a zeppelin blows by but i'd have a good try to drill a thick hole in the air i wish i had joined the staff college they work at the juice of a pace drawer and maps regular rippers fetching generals their slippers but you can use your brains at the base i wish i'd applied for munitions you'd see me do half weekly spells no unions i'd worry by being in a hurry no i'd get the v c making shells but i've been and entered the infantry and i lives like an eel in the slosh damn fool did you say lad well any old way lad it's we that gets quits with the bosch the sergeant the sergeant as is uses i used to doubt of it he did not like the way i washed his head seemed bulged a bit my arms drill seemed to hurt him he'd swear and close his eyes and when i had no time to shave he would not sympathize at home in good old england when dealing with recruits he seemed to hide his better self they had dirty boots but in this trench a sittin all crouched upon my joints i do not mind admittin the sergeant has its points he's just been round explainin that jumpin up to see if shells is goin to burst your way is waste of energy shells though you can't believe it aren't always aimed at you but snipers if they see your ed will put a bullet through his words about the boches is also comforting he says as good a shot as me could do a dozen in and if it came to bayonets i'd easy stick a score the way i fight i never knew he thought me smart before and always he says lad mind this we're going to win it's no use thinking gloomy thoughts whatever fix you're in suppose we did get out it england would not forget and where's the man that is a man that would not die for that august nineteen sixteen End of section two. Section three of War Poems and Other Verses by Robert Ernest Verned. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Other Verses The July Garden. It's July in my garden, and steel blue are the globe thistles, and French gray the willows that bow to every breeze and deep in every currant bush a robber blackbird whistles i'm pickin i'm pickin i'm pickin these so off i go to rout them and find instead i'm gazing at clusters of delphiniums the seed was small and brown but these are spurs that fell from heaven and caught the most amazing colors of the welkin zone as they came hurtling down and then some roses catch my eye or maybe some sweet williams or pink and white and purple peals of canterbury bells or penciled violas that peep between the three-leaved trilliums or red-hot pokers all aglow or poppies that cast spells 
and while i stare at each in turn i quite forget or pardon the blackbirds and the blackguards that keep robbing me of pie for what do these things matter when i have so fair a garden and what is half so lovely as my garden in july standen july nineteen fourteen to a princess princess what sore of fate shall one win in the world than to be lowered from love's first estimate to see her heart grow cold her brows elate questioning and lips with scorn a little curled then on her cheeks the blushing banners furled that told of love's alliance and too late the irrevocable guest gifts alternate into the ebb tide of oblivion hurled not wittingly o oh sweetheart did i seem larger than my real self if it were so only in thy light of splendour did i glow so splendid as to earn thy dear esteem and if the dream is gone and i must go remember that i loved and did not dream who is your like of all that grim portrayed is lovely locks a lady of his pen or would you play at princess scorn the men who to an hateful goblin's power betrayed was rescued by a princess magic blade or maybe you are beauty as i deemed then when first you came into my wandering ken beauty a tennis-playing english maid i care not what you be for all at last were one to look upon the proper man beauty and lovely locks the unsurpassed and the fair scorner sick of caliban i love so much at last that none grew paler to find their prince was maybe but a tailor o oh, happy times when lovers only need was fairy godmother or magic sword or tablecloth that spread a sumptuous board whene'er the prince expressed a wish to feed when waiters were invisible and unfeed when ocean was no wider than a ford to seven league boot and mangy scripts could breed of gold an unimaginable hoard what prince to-day can carve a dragon's shank and in the flying trunk without a fear elope with the dear lady of his heart now at a ledger he must ply his part and wearily in some suburban bank weigh love against a hundred pounds a year a delirium so this young life is gone from us god send peace to his soul amen and we that grieve some little consolation may conceive and dwelling on the days that death made end how stainless seventy times seven did i offend how full of splendid promise should he live kind lips that lie what promise did i give how well beloved thank god i had a friend i'm on the wings of some tumultuous night adown unceasing silences along wastes where wild-eyed deliriums sink and swell by crazy shores and seas that circle wrong bodiless mindless without voice or sight speed to the maze and madnesses of hell friendship i had a friend and so we went together merry and armed for every kind of weather far was the road but tired no man could find us we laughed at the hills so soon they dropped behind us i had a friend yet not long had we started when we fell out and in our anger parted the clouds dipped down the mountains rose to screen him oh passers-by long years i have not seen him far is the road and always it is lonely i am a man and therefore march i only it lures me not the goal for which we started i seek my friend my friend from whom i parted an apology listen i also have a lady fair whose praise in many a passionate rhyme should ring were i not weak for all love's licensing the wonder of her beauty to declare and while your lady's loveliness you blare i tremble lest my notes fail on the string lest men that hear me question wondering was beauty that inspired so poor an air yet when all songs are sung all praises told and you demand with your last proudest tone men's verdict is the prize for his or mine i shall but show my love saying behold what song shall match her 
and all men shall own your words less sweet my lady more divine to an english sheep-dog old dog what times we had you she and i since first you came and with your trustful air blundered into her lap a valiant shy small tub-shaped woolly bear what lovely days we had how fast they flew in hillside ramblings galloping by the sea you grew too large for laps but never grew too large for loyalty we have known friends who living passed away your faith no man could turn no passion kill even when death called you would scarcely obey until you knew our will out in the fields i bore you in my arms dear thick coat on your grave the grass is spring but he that sees no sparrow meets with harms hath your soul's shepherding and will that king who knows all hearts and ways kennel you where the winds blow long and fair that you who ever loathe the warm still days may snuff in upland air and will he let you scamper o'er the meads where his hills close their everlasting ranks and show you pools that mirror grey-green reeds to cool your heaving flanks and will he feed you with good things at even bring the bowl with his own hands maybe and will you hunting in your dreams in heaven dream that you hunt with me yes you will not forget and when we come what time or by what gate we may not tell hastening to meet our friend that men called dumb across the ditch of hell you'll hear you first of all o strong and fleet how you will dash and arrow to the mark lord but there'll be deaf angels when we meet and you leap up and bark to a hippopotamus lines written in dejection on seeing a river horse a fragment beast that wattlest in the ooze where mid afric rivers lose sight of the sheer hills they left in silvery leaps from cleft to cleft but not yet with gathering roll have espied their final goal that great sea which we and they must be mingled with some day beast that in this midway slime passest a primeval time say what fancy did give birth to thy super monstrous girth did the devil think it well to hoist thee up one day from hell so that the crystal streams might be churned with thy vast turpidity or did he think to stay a flood this nightmare horse is very good seeing that with his golf-like mouth he could drink ocean to a drouth the kid and the tanner a white kid on a village green imagining itself unseen sported in such a graceful manner it caught the attention of a tanner the tanner watched and mused and said to see you prancing on your head some foolish folk o oh milk-white kid would very gladly pay a quid to me it seems a sort of shame that one so young should for a game without a thought of what is meat render himself too tough to eat the kid replied but mr tanner it's lovely playing in this manner why should i then my young life spoiling cease to become more fit for boiling the tanner frowned though fairly mild such heedless language made him wild or as he would himself allege set all his moral self on edge each kid he cried by nature's laws and man's subserves some higher cause not merely his own goatish pleasure and ought to learn to be a treasure now you'll be useless for the pot and far too gamblesome god wot to draw along at nursemaid's pace a goat-cart in a watering place the kid believing that this view from one so serious must be true first wept then said if it knew how twould be a better goat from now the tanner mused he wished to aid a helpless creature that had strayed he mused for quite a lengthy spell he wished to aid himself as well really i hardly know what you he said at last are fit to do stay in my tannery at least your skin could be preserved poor beast nay more if you will be advised you can become immortalized and though from you twill have to sever your skin may gamble on forever dear mr tanner straight replied 
the wondering kid much gratified i find it very hard believe me to think my ears do not deceive me for how dear mr tanner how can that same skin i'm wearing now shorn from my frame so lithe and taper continue as you say to caper the tanner smiled all business men enjoy a whimsy now and then and chiefly when the indulging of it may cause a gain not loss of profit the tanner smiled and cleared his throat and said on quite a merry note no kid a nymph as gay as you requires a shoe or rather two your skin once tanned and healed and sold and lacquered to the tint of gold will just suffice to make those slippers size number four to fit her flippers thus then when you are dead and gone still will a kid go capering on or rather neath her skirts will glide two twinkling kidlets side by side the kid persuaded in this manner gladly accompanied the tanner and entering his odiferous portal with great dispatch became immortal moral tis better kids to frisk and frivol than to take counsel of the devil even though he has the business manner and state appearance of a tanner End of section three. End of war poems and other verses by Robert Ernest Vernet. Section three of war poems and other verses by Robert Ernest Vernet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Other verses. The July Garden. It's July in my garden and steel blue are the globe thistles and french gray the willows that bow to every breeze and deep in every currant bush a robber blackbird whistles i'm pickin i'm pickin i'm pickin these so off i go to rout them and find instead i'm gazing at clusters of delphiniums the seed was small and brown but these are spurs that fell from heaven and caught the most amazing colors of the welkin zone as they came hurtling down and then some roses catch my eye or maybe some sweet williams or pink and white and purple peals of canterbury bells or penciled violas that peep between the three-leaved trilliums or red-hot pokers all aglow or poppies that cast spells and while i stare at each in turn i quite forget or pardon the blackbirds and the blackguards that keep robbing me of pie for what do these things matter when i have so fair a garden and what is half so lovely as my garden in july standen july nineteen fourteen to a princess princess what sore fate shall one win in the world than to be lowered from love's first estimate to see her heart grow cold her brows elate questioning and lips with scorn a little curled then on her cheeks the blushing banners furled that told of love's alliance and too late the irrevocable guest gifts alternate into the ebb tide of oblivion hurled not wittingly oh sweetheart did i seem larger than my real self if it were so only in thy light of splendour did i glow so splendid as to earn thy dear esteem and if the dream is gone and i must go remember that i loved and did not dream who is your like of all that grim portrayed is lovely locks a lady of his pen or would you play at princess scorn the men who to an hateful goblin's power betrayed was rescued by a princess magic blade or maybe you are beauty as i deemed then when first you came into my wandering ken beauty a tennis playing english maid i care not what you be for all at last were one to look upon the proper man beauty and lovely locks the unsurpassed and the fair scorner sick of caliban i loved so much at last that none grew paler to find their prince was maybe but a tailor oh happy times when lovers only need was fairy godmother or magic sword or tablecloth that spread a sumptuous board whene'er the prince expressed a wish to feed when waiters were invisible and unfeed, when ocean was no wider than a ford to seven-league boot, 
in mangy scripts could breed of gold an unimaginable hoard what prince to-day can carve a dragon's shank and in the flying trunk without a fear elope with the dear lady of his heart now at a ledger he must ply his part and wearily in some suburban bank weigh love against a hundred pounds a year a delirium so this young life is gone from us god send peace to his soul amen and we that grieve some little consolation may conceive and dwelling on the days that death made end how stainless seventy times seven did i offend how full of splendid promise should he live kind lips that lie what promise did i give how well beloved thank god i had a friend i'm on the wings of some tumultuous night adown unceasing silences along wastes where wild-eyed delirium sink and swell by crazy shores and seas that circle wrong bodiless mindless without voice or sight speed to the maze and madnesses of hell friendship i had a friend and so we went together merry and armed for every kind of weather far was the road but tired no man could find us we laughed at the hills so soon they dropped behind us i had a friend yet not long had we started when we fell out and in our anger parted the clouds dipped down the mountains rose to screen him oh passers-by long years i have not seen him far is the road and always it is lonely i am a man and therefore march i only it lures me not the goal for which we started i seek my friend my friend from whom i parted an apology listen i also have a lady fair whose praise in many a passionate rhyme should ring were i not weak for all love's licensing the wonder of her beauty to declare and while your lady's loveliness you blare i tremble lest my notes fail on the string lest men that hear me question wondering was't beauty that inspired so poor an air yet when all songs are sung all praises told and you demand with your last proudest tone men's verdict is the prize for his or mine i shall but show my love saying behold what song shall match her and all men shall own your words less weak my lady more divine to an english sheep-dog old dog what times we had you she and i since first you came and with your trustful air blundered into her lap a valiant shy small tub-shaped woolly bear what lovely days we had how fast they flew in hillside ramblings galloping by the sea you grew too large for laps but never grew too large for loyalty we have known friends who living passed away your faith no man could turn no passion kill even when death called you would scarcely obey until you knew our will out in the fields i bore you in my arms dear thick coat on your grave the grasses spring but he that sees no sparrow meets with harms hath your soul's shepherding and will that king who knows all hearts and ways kennel you where the winds blow long and fair that you who ever loathe the warm still days may snuff in upland air and will he let you scamper o'er the meads where his hills close their everlasting ranks and show you pools that mirror grey-green reeds to cool your heaving flanks and will he feed you with good things at even bring the bowl with his own hands maybe and will you hunting in your dreams in heaven dream that you hunt with me yes you will not forget and when we come what time or by what gate we may not tell hastening to meet our friend that men called dumb across the ditch of hell you'll hear you first of all o strong and fleet how you will dash and arrow to the mark lord but there'll be deaf angels when we meet and you leap up and bark to a hippopotamus lines written in dejection on seeing a river horse a fragment beast that wattlest in the ooze 
where mid afric rivers lose sight of the sheer hills they left in silvery leaps from cleft to cleft but not yet with gathering roll have espied their final goal that great sea which we and they must be mingled with some day beast that in this midway slime passest a primeval time say what fancy did give birth to thy super monstrous girth did the devil think it well to hoist thee up one day from hell so that the crystal streams might be churned with thy vast turpidity or did he think to stay a flood this nightmare horse is very good seeing that with his golf-like mouth he could drink ocean to a drought the kid and the tanner a white kid on a village green imagining itself unseen sported in such a graceful manner it caught the attention of a tanner the tanner watched and mused and said to see you prancing on your head some foolish folk o oh, milk-white kid would very gladly pay a quid to me it seems a sort of shame that one so young should for a game without a thought of what is meat render himself too tough to eat the kid replied but mr tanner it's lovely playing in this manner why should i then my young life spoiling cease to become more fit for boiling the tanner frowned though fairly mild such heedless language made him wild or as he would himself allege set all his moral self on edge each kid he cried by nature's laws and man's subserves some higher cause not merely his own goatish pleasure and ought to learn to be a treasure now you'll be useless for the pot and far too gamblesome god wot to draw along at nursemaid's pace a goat-cart in a watering place the kid believing that this view from one so serious must be true first wept then said if it knew how twould be a better goat from now the tanner mused he wished to aid a helpless creature that had strayed he mused for quite a lengthy spell he wished to aid himself as well really i hardly know what you he said at last are fit to do stay in my tannery at least your skin could be preserved poor beast nay more if you will be advised you can become immortalized and though from you twill have to sever your skin may gamble on for ever dear mr tanner straight replied the wondering kid much gratified I find it very hard, believe me, to think my ears do not deceive me. For how, dear Mr. Tanner, how can that same skin I'm wearing now, shorn from my frame so lithe and taper, continue, as you say, to caper? The Tanner smiled. All businessmen enjoy a whimsy now and then, and chiefly when the indulging of it may cause a gain, not loss, of profit. The Tanner smiled and cleared his throat, and said on quite a merry note, no kid a nymph as gay as you requires a shoe or rather two your skin once tanned and healed and sold and lacquered to the tint of gold will just suffice to make those slippers size number four to fit her flippers thus then when you are dead and gone still will a kid go capering on or rather neath her skirts will glide two twinkling kidlets side by side the kid persuaded in this manner gladly accompanied the tanner and entering his odiferous portal with great dispatch became immortal moral tis better kids to frisk and frivol than to take counsel of the devil even though he has the business manner and state appearance of a tanner end of section three end of war poems and other verses by robert ernest Vernet. Section 3 of War Poems and Other Verses by Robert Ernest Verned. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Other Verses The July Garden It's July in my garden, and steel blue are the globe thistles, and French gray the willows that bow to every breeze, and deep in every currant bush a robber blackbird whistles, I'm pickin', I'm pickin', I'm pickin' these. 
so off i go to rout them and find instead i'm gazing at clusters of delphiniums the seed was small and brown but these are spurs that fell from heaven and caught the most amazing colors of the welkin zone as they came hurtling down and then some roses catch my eye or maybe some sweet williams or pink and white and purple peals of canterbury bells or penciled violas that peep between the three-leaved trilliums or red-hot pokers all aglow or poppies that cast spells and while i stare at each in turn i quite forget or pardon the blackbirds and the blackguards that keep robbing me of pie for what do these things matter when i have so fair a garden and what is half so lovely as my garden in july standen july nineteen fourteen to a princess princess what sore fate shall one win in the world than to be lowered from love's first estimate to see her heart grow cold her brows elate questioning and lips with scorn a little curled then on her cheeks the blushing banners furled that told of love's alliance and too late the irrevocable guest gifts alternate into the ebb tide of oblivion hurled not wittingly o oh sweetheart did i seem larger than my real self if it were so only in thy light of splendour did i glow so splendid as to earn thy dear esteem and if the dream is gone and i must go remember that i loved and did not dream who is your like of all that grim portrayed is lovely locks a lady of his pen or would you play at princess scorn the men who to an hateful goblin's power betrayed was rescued by a princess magic blade or maybe you are beauty as i deemed then when first you came into my wandering ken beauty a tennis-playing english maid i care not what you be for all at last were one to look upon the proper man beauty and lovely locks the unsurpassed and the fair scorner sick of caliban i loved so much at last that none grew paler to find their prince was maybe but a tailor oh happy times when lovers only need was fairy godmother or magic sword or tablecloth that spread a sumptuous board whene'er the prince expressed a wish to feed when waiters were invisible and unfeed when ocean was no wider than a ford to seven league boot and mangy scripts could breed of gold an unimaginable hoard what prince to-day can carve a dragon's shank and in a flying trunk without a fear elope with the dear lady of his heart now at a ledger he must ply his part and wearily in some suburban bank weigh love against a hundred pounds a year a delirium so this young life is gone from us god send peace to his soul amen and we that grieve some little consolation may conceive and dwelling on the days that death made end how stainless seventy times seven did i offend how full of splendid promise should he live kind lips that lie what promise did i give how well beloved thank god i had a friend i'm on the wings of some tumultuous night adown unceasing silences along wastes where wild-eyed deliriums sink and swell by crazy shores and seas that circle wrong bodiless mindless without voice or sight speed to the maze and madnesses of hell friendship i had a friend and so we went together merry and armed for every kind of weather far was the road but tired no man could find us we laughed at the hills so soon they dropped behind us i had a friend yet not long had we started when we fell out and in our anger parted the clouds dipped down the mountains rose to screen him o oh, passers-by long years i have not seen him far is the road and always it is lonely i am a man and therefore march i only it lures me not the goal for which we started i seek my friend my friend from whom i parted an apology listen i also have a lady fair whose praise in many a passionate rhyme should ring 
were i not weak for all love's licensing the wonder of her beauty to declare and while your lady's loveliness you blare i tremble lest my notes fail on the string lest men that hear me question wondering wast beauty that inspired so poor an air yet when all songs are sung all praise is told and you demand with your last proudest tone men's verdict is the prize for his or mine i shall but show my love saying behold what song shall match her and all men shall own your words less weak my lady more divine to an english sheep-dog old dog what times we had you she and i since first you came and with your trustful air blundered into her lap a valiant shy small tub-shaped woolly bear what lovely days we had how fast they flew in hillside ramblings galloping by the sea you grew too large for laps but never grew too large for loyalty we have known friends who living passed away your faith no man could turn no passion kill even when death called you would scarcely obey until you knew our will out in the fields i bore you in my arms dear thick coat on your grave the grasses spring but he that sees no sparrow meets with harms hath your soul's shepherding and will that king who knows all hearts and ways kennel you where the winds blow long and fair that you who ever loathe the warm still days may snuff in upland air and will he let you scamper o'er the meads where his hills close their everlasting ranks and show you pools that mirror grey-green reeds to cool your heaving flanks and will he feed you with good things at even bring the bowl with his own hands maybe and will you hunting in your dreams in heaven dream that you hunt with me yes you will not forget and when we come what time or by what gate we may not tell hastening to meet our friend that men called dumb across the ditch of hell you'll hear you first of all o strong and fleet how you will dash and arrow to the mark lord but there'll be deaf angels when we meet and you leap up and bark to a hippopotamus lines written in dejection on seeing a river horse a fragment beast that wattlest in the ooze where mid afric rivers lose sight of the sheer hills they left in silvery leaps from cleft to cleft but not yet with gathering roll have espied their final goal that great sea which we and they must be mingled with some day beast that in this midway slime passest a primeval time say what fancy did give birth to thy super monstrous girth did the devil think it well to hoist thee up one day from hell so that the crystal streams might be churned with thy vast turpidity or did he think to stay a flood this nightmare horse is very good seeing that with his golf-like mouth he could drink ocean to a drouth the kid and the tanner a white kid on a village green imagining itself unseen sported in such a graceful manner it caught the attention of a tanner the tanner watched and mused and said to see you prancing on your head some foolish folk o oh, milk-white kid would very gladly pay a quid to me it seems a sort of shame that one so young should for a game without a thought of what is meat render himself too tough to eat the kid replied but mr tanner it's lovely playing in this manner why should i then my young life spoiling cease to become more fit for boiling the tanner frowned though fairly mild such heedless language made him wild or as he would himself allege set all his moral self on edge each kid he cried by nature's laws and man's subserves some higher cause not merely his own goatish pleasure and ought to learn to be a treasure now you'll be useless for the pot and far too gamblesome god wot to draw along at nursemaid's pace a goat-cart in a watering place the kid believing that this view from one so serious must be true first wept then said if it knew how twould be a better goat from now 
the tanner mused he wished to aid a helpless creature that had strayed he mused for quite a lengthy spell he wished to aid himself as well really i hardly know what you he said at last are fit to do stay in my tannery at least your skin could be preserved poor beast nay more if you will be advised you can become immortalized and though from you twill have to sever your skin may gamble on for ever dear mr tanner straight replied the wondering kid much gratified i find it very hard believe me to think my ears do not deceive me for how dear mr tanner how can that same skin i'm wearing now shorn from my frame so lithe and taper continue as you say to caper the tanner smiled all business men enjoy a whimsy now and then and chiefly when the indulging of it may cause a gain not loss of profit the tanner smiled and cleared his throat and said on quite a merry note no kid a nymph as gay as you requires a shoe or rather two your skin once tanned and healed and sold and lacquered to the tint of gold will just suffice to make those slippers size number four to fit her flippers thus then when you are dead and gone still will a kid go capering on or rather neath her skirts will glide two twinkling kidlets side by side the kid persuaded in this manner gladly accompanied the tanner and entering his odiferous portal with great dispatch became immortal moral tis better kids to frisk and frivol than to take counsel of the devil even though he has the business manner and staid appearance of a tanner end of section three end of war poems and other verses by robert ernest vernet